It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Sean Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's your morning rundown. Israeli forces are gathering at the Gaza border for a possible ground assault. Now, the death toll continues to climb as a complete siege of the Gaza Strip cuts off supplies from passing through to over 2 million people. In Washington, members of Congress are anxious to provide aid to Israel, but cannot do so without a House speaker. Republicans are holding a vote this morning to determine who, if anyone, has the support to win the speakership. And also on our rundown this morning, the Fed speak continues. San Francisco Fed's Mary Daly reiterated earlier comments that the recent jump in bond yields may mean less work for the Fed. But not everyone is convinced. The Minneapolis Fed President's Neil Kashkari calling the rate outlook unclear. And the rising yields perplexing. Investors and the Fed will get a clearer inflation picture tomorrow thanks to CPI data. That's going to be out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And clog lovers unite. Divisively fashionable shoe wear maker Birkenstock is going public today. Now the company's debut is the latest key test for the market after last month's flurry of IPO activity. Names like Arm Holdings, Clavio, and Instacart all enjoyed a big boost on their first day of trading. But shares have since pared back those gains. Will Birkenstock be any different? Well, to our morning driver here, today's morning driver, the latest round of Fed speak leans dovish, and that offers some relief to investors looking for positive signals to hold on to. At the annual convention for the American Bankers Association, Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank President Rafael Bostic said that he doesn't feel we need to increase rates anymore in order to get inflation back down to the Fed's 2 percent goal. Bostic believes that even though the economy is slowing down, he doesn't see the U.S. heading into a recession. But despite some progress we've seen with inflation, Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman striking a more hawkish tone. Bowman repeated her stance on a higher rate regime, saying rates may need to rise further and stay restrictive for some time to help restore the FOMC's goal. Thursday's inflation print will certainly be a key factor in the central bank's next decision. That decision, of course, as we continue to discuss day in, day out, is going to be in November, and that will really place focus on the CPI print that we get tomorrow, perhaps a little bit more of the producer price index, which we actually got out this morning, where final demand increased by about half a percent in September, and final demand prices rose seven-tenths of a percent in August, six-tenths of a percent in July. So all that considered, uh, a trove of data more that the Fed will have to really kind of lean into for its next decision, where they are expected, at least at this point, to continue perhaps in their hiking pathway. Yeah, Brad, lots of focus on that CPI print that we're going to get tomorrow, especially on the heels of the very strong jobs report that we got last Friday. We did see wages moderate just a bit, but we did see an uptick on a month-over-month basis. Obviously, still over 4% on a year-over-year basis, so the upward pressure that that could potentially place on inflation, on the Fed's battle to get inflation back to that 2% target. One of the key issues that Fed officials are examining here, so we'll get a clearer picture, I think, tomorrow once we get that CPI print. But as you can see from the recent commentary here from Fed officials, there is still a big split just in terms of what is necessary, what needs to be done in order to get to that 2% target and also what that new normal rate is most likely being. You mentioned there, uh, Mary Daly, San Francisco Fed president, her comments there about the neutral rate. Fed officials estimated that it was 2.5% since before the pandemic actually may have risen to 3%. Not the first person to bring this up, but certainly something to keep in mind as we talk about future Fed policy and what that could potentially look like. And then, of course, if we do see another hike, yeah. what impact that's going to have on the markets and, of course, what impact that's going to have on the economy. Yeah, I'm taking a look at the CME FedWatch tool right now, and it's amazing. Some of the probabilities have drastically moved even since this time last month. And, of course, this time last month we were kind of not going into a, a nothing burger meeting as I may have been too swift to classify it, but many of the economists that we spoke with were, were clear about where the dot plot is going to have that much more significance. And that could continue to be the case, especially especially given the probabilities that we're looking at right now, where the CMA FedWatch tool is pointing towards, as you're seeing on your screen, just shy of a 90 percent chance that there will be no move. And, and particularly here, as we think about what that sets up going into next year, for many who have perhaps hoped at this point, and there's a lot of hopium for a cut to come in the first quarter, that hopium may need to increase itself because at the end of the day, uh, it still seems like the Fed is going to wait to see exactly how some of the data um, continues to show up and where the consumer is in this broader economy. And, and I think 
that's going to be uh, the, the continuous element that that hopium is really hinging on right now. But I, I don't think that hopium is strong enough for a cut at this point. No, certainly yeah. not. Well, Brad, you mentioned the consumer. Let's talk about one of the retail plays that certainly is a focus here among the street, and that's in the IPO world. Birkenstock <laughs> making its public debut this morning on the New York Stock Exchange. The German shoemaker planning to offer roughly 10 million shares at $46 a share under the ticker symbol B-I-R-K, Burke. Now, Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma has the details for us. Brooke. Good morning, Shauna. That's right. The company pricing in at $46 a share. Now, that's in the middle of the indicated range. And according to multiple reports, the company taking a conservative approach here amid market volatility. But yet there is still high demand for this 250-year-old shoe company. Birkenstock really known here for those clogs, for those sandals, but the company really building up in recent years. Since 2013, the company then formed the Birkenstock Group, and since then, revenue has been growing at an annual rate of 20 percent. In fiscal 2022, the company brought in $1.32 billion dollars or 1.24 billion euros. Now, of course, the company is based in Germany. Their headquarters here in the U.S. is in California. But this is the fourth IPO that the U.S. stock market has seen in recent weeks. Of course, we saw Arm, Clavio, and Instacart all boom in their IPO's debut, but now falling back a little bit. And now, you know, a, a, one expert telling Yahoo Finance that Birkenstock here could be the real test as to whether the IPO market is fully back or whether this was all just a false storm. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, $158 clogs here. That's, that's the real test for a lot of consumers. Um, how does Birkenstock, though, differ from other recent IPOs? Yeah, Brad, well, age is certainly on Birkenstock's side. I mean, think about it. This company is 249 years old, and it has stood the test of time. When you think about other companies that have gone public in the past, this one stands out. Goldman Sachs right behind it, well, trailing behind, actually. This company was 130 years old when it went public. American Express, 127 years old when it went public. J&J, &J, 108. And Campbell's Soup, 85 years old when it went public. So Birkenstock really standing ahead of the crowd. Out when you think about just how long it's been around, but compared to its others in that recent IPO boom that we've seen, others are also fairly new. Arm was founded in 1990. Kava founded in 2010. That's when they opened their first location. Grocery delivery company Instacart was founded in 2012. And Clavio was founded in 2012 and as well. And Birkenstock's origins trace back to 1774. So when you think about just how many historical events, how much market volatility that this company has faced, it certainly does have that on its side. But one brand expert says it also it has a way of just being familiar with multiple generations. She said it's like rediscovering an old vinyl and realizing that it's a timeless hit. And Birkenstocks wears that value, wears that historic uh, nature on its sleeve. And in the filing, the company said despite this heritage, Birkenstock remains empowered by a youthful energy level. Of course, earlier this summer, we saw Birkenstock uh, at the end of the Barbie movie, which got a lot of buzz. But really, Birkenstock's <laughs> marketing play here continues to be word of mouth. And that's how, really, it stayed relevant all these years and continues to stand the test of time. So we'll see how it does in the debut today. All right, Yahoo Finance Zone, Brooke De Palma, talking all things Birkenstock this morning. We're going to be tracking that ticker very closely as we move on throughout the rest of the day. Thanks so much, Brooke. Also, we got to talk about wholesale prices. They came in hotter than expected for September. The producer's price index rising a half a percent for the month and 2.2 percent for the year. We can see stock futures reacting to these numbers, erasing some of the gains from earlier this morning. Investors digesting once again that inflation could remain sticky and cause the Fed to keep rates higher for longer. We have more inflation data on deck for Thursday as well. Here with what the markets need to see from that CPI print is Seema Shah, Principal Asset Management Global, uh, Chief Global Strategist. Seema, uh, I'm not sure if you're a, a Birkenstocks fan or not, but I think all of us are, are fans of getting this inflation under control here. So what do you expect to get into that CPI print tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on. Well, the inflation number tomorrow, I mean, I don't need to exaggerate how important that's going to be in terms of how people are going to think about future Fed policy. 
for our expectations for inflation broadly as well as just for tomorrow, it's still a picture of slight disinflation, but overall, it's fairly sticky inflation. So we're not anticipating uh, US CPI returning down to 2% next year. We think it's going to hover around the 2.5%. So hopefully you get good news tomorrow. But I think the bigger picture is, you know, where do we go from here? Are we expecting it to go down to 2%? And if not, how comfortable can the Fed be with a number which is still above target? Simon, when it comes to what the Fed could potentially do next, obviously a lot is going to hinge on the data that we have yet to get. But there has been this focus on the recent uh, pretty quick spike in yields and how much pressure that could potentially put on the economy, whether or not, whether or not that's going to be enough for the Fed to remain on the sidelines or hold potential uh, future rate hikes. Where do you stand in that line of thinking and the impact that that could potentially then have on the equity market? Yeah, it's definitely been a really interesting discussion from Fed speakers in the last few days. And, and what we have seen is um, with that spike in bond yields, financial conditions have tightened fairly considerably in the last month or so. And remember, when the Fed um, announced the most recent dot plot, that was when yields were high, but they weren't as high as they are today. So that additional rate hike that they have within that dot plot almost has to be countered a little bit by the, 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 the rise in yields. Uh, I think the key thing, though, here is as we've heard Fed speakers noting that that additional spike in bond yields could be the equivalent of another rate hike. What you've seen now is that bond yields have come right back down again because people have been pulling back their expectations. So they're almost undoing some of those factors that the Fed is watching. So it is a little bit circular. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, we can see that there is still some underlying upward momentum uh, concerns about Treasury issuance, the size of the deficit, deficit uh, concerns about what the Bank of Japan's future policy shifts are going to do which suggests that there could be some further upward momentum. Um, but certainly we think we're close to a peak. And for the equity market, and that's, you know, I think you've hit the real point here, is for the equity market, the thing that they're watching more than anything at this stage is how far bond yields are going to rise. So if you get a continued drop in yields like we've seen the last few days, I think equity market is going to take a lot of solace from that. And you could see some stabilization with it staying fairly range bound through to the end of the year. Is there a top strategy or a top kind of portfolio positioning that investors would be apt to consider going into the Fed's next meeting? Well, I think generally speaking, given the volatility that you're seeing um, at the moment across all global markets, I think it makes sense to, to be very much diversified. I know, you know we all talk about that, but I think particularly at this time, diversification is really important. We have actually chosen to be fairly neutral across portfolios. Uh, because actually the, the narrative of the market is quite unclear. Uh, and that's not unusual. Typically, when you get to turning points in central bank policy, uh, there is a fair amount of volatility. Uh, investors struggle to figure out what the, the near-term narrative is. So actually, what we're thinking is you're best almost waiting till early 24, when we have a clear idea of where the economy is going and, most importantly, what the Fed is going to be doing. At that point, we would assume that the Fed is on pause. Uh, and the next move would be down, although it probably wouldn't be till the middle of next year. So at that point, I think you'll have a, a clearer idea. So for the time being, it's fairly neutral, uh, noting that equity markets are likely to stay fairly range bound through to the end of the year. Seema, what's your assessment, just the risk that the Israel-Hamas war, the fact that it could potentially widen here, what that poses to the market in the short term and also looking ahead into the next couple of years with chances that maybe this is a conflict that's going to last for some time. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's really important for investors that when they look at geopolitics, you, know, you have to take a lot of the emotion out, unfortunately. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible period. Um, typically, what we see with geopolitical events is that the short-term direct impact on the market is quite, sh is quite small. Uh, it doesn't last for too long. The bigger impact is those indirect effects. You know, what does it do ultimately to inflation to growth and therefore to bond deals and equity markets. And for that, the one key factor that we need to be keeping a close eye on is oil prices. And as you said, if the turmoil escalates um, and that were to put further upward pressure on oil prices, and I, when I say further upward pressure, I mean meaningful upward pressure to the $120 a mark, even to the $150 a mark, that's when I think investors should be a little bit more concerned about the growth outlook um, and maybe even what the Fed will have to do because Although central banks will, in the near term, look through inflation increases, which are driven by oil price gains, uh, over a, a prolonged period, typically, those oil price gains do creep into core inflation and to inflation expectations, 
which would significantly com complicate the matter for the Fed and other global central banks. So that's what we're watching out for. Um, it's oil prices, which is really going to be the key uh, factor that is going to be, you know, giving us a bit of judgment on how to be positioned. All right, Seema Shah, always great uh, to hear your insight. Principal Asset Management Chief Global Strategist. Thanks, Seema. Well, a leadership shakeup is officially coming to Walgreens. The healthcare giant announcing Tim Wentworth will take the helm beginning October 23rd, nearly two months after Roz Brewer stepped down from the position. Now, Wentworth is the former CEO of health services company Evernorth and Express Scripts. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimalani has the details for us, Anj. That's right, Shauna. The announcement this morning after there were already reports that he was being looked at to replace Roz Brewer who, as we know, left abruptly a couple of months ago. There are also a number of C-suite positions still left vacant that Walgreens has said in their statement today that they are looking to fill. Now, Tim Wentworth, an interesting uh, uh, new, new fill for this position. As we know, the company has said they are looking for someone with a deeper healthcare experience. Wentworth does have a little bit of experience also in the retail space, working for American and PepsiCo in the past. He's also got pharma experience with some time at Merck. So there's a lot going on with this healthcare executive's background. Now, we've already seen a little bit of a reaction to this news. JPM analyst Lisa Gill in a note this morning saying that, quote, while there is work to be done across the company, we'll believe this is a good starting point entering fiscal year 24 and in anticipate the stock will react positively. We've already seen that in the pre-market trading up about 2.5%. So certainly some good news for the company, which had uh, been struggling post-pandemic Post COVID boom wane, we've seen you know the last earnings was a bit of a struggle, and there's always been this discussion about Walgreens being a retail pharmacy store, uh, you know, starting to edge into the healthcare space like competitor CVS. So uh, Tim Wentworth, though, uh, an interesting pick because he also you know just came off of his uh, non-compete with Cigna. He's got a pharma and retail experience, like I said, and with that innovation leadership at Evernorth puts him in an interesting position with Walgreens deep, you know, diving deeper into this healthcare space. Walgreens does not have an insurance business, which is one of the key sort of differences between it and CVS right now. Uh, Walgreens also did keep its clinical trial business going after CVS pulled out and also benefited from that move. So really going to be interesting to see what Wentworth brings to the table and what his thoughts are on everything going on. Also in the background, we know that, of course, the Walgreens of workers, the pharmacists, uh, have staged a few walkouts. So there's some frustration at the retail and employee level. So a lot for this new CEO to take on just a day before their earnings. Yeah, this is really interesting, Anj, because in the release they and the announcement here, they talk about this growth, this next phase of growth for Walgreens Boots Alliance into a customer-centric healthcare company, and then also talking about where they continue to need to right-size the business, drive execution, create greater value for employees, patients, customers, shareholders. I mean, this is a tall task for this next phase. Where do you think the, the, this signals the company is going to lean further into? Well, you've already seen them with that Village MD, you know, acquisition and, and building up that those healthcare services. Uh, there's that. There's also the clinical trial space. They're trying to get, you know, deeper into those relationships with the pharma industry, making sure that there's a lot going on with development and being at the point where they can influence clinical trial diversity being a big issue. That, of course, has been something that uh, has been sort of talked about in the background with Wentworth's appointment, replacing Roz and, and how to how that signals diversity for the company. Uh, in addition, mm. there is also, you know, the question mark of what else Walgreens can do. Retail has long been and retail pharmacy has been struggling in the last few years. If you recall, pre-pandemic, there was a lot of questions. It was mostly just front of store versus filling scripts is what was analyzed for earnings. And it was always, uh, you know, just a, a balance or a trade off there. With more businesses under their umbrella, they do have the opportunity to leverage, uh, you know, their their wide footprint, nationwide footprint to tap into that $4 trillion industry. So it will be, like I said, a pretty interesting to see if they even consider the insurance business. That's been one of the questions uh, that has been popping up because of Wentworth's background. So we don't know those answers yet, and I'm sure we'll get some answers potentially, hopefully, uh, tomorrow.
<laughs> yeah, we're going to be looking out for that. We know you will as well. Yahoo Finance's own Anjali Kamlani. Thanks so much, Anjali, for the breakdown there on all things Walgreens, Boots Alliance, and this executive move here. Now over to Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi, who's standing by with a big interview this morning. Sazi. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. Of course, lots of focus on food and beverage stocks, weight loss drugs uh, getting sold all over the place. Lots of focus on how that might impact the future of food in this country. Let's bring in Conagra brand CEO Sean Conley. Sean, always great to get some time with you on Yahoo Finance. I think you just gave one of the most interesting earnings calls I have heard in the past year, highlighting really some changing consumer habits. Walk us through that, and what are you seeing from the U.S. consumer here? Sure. Uh, good to talk to you, Brian. Uh, yeah, it was it was a good quarter on a lot of metrics for us. We saw strong performance at gross margin, at operating margin within supply chain. EPS was strong. Uh, so a lot of things were working really well. We did see some softness on the top line, and I pointed out that we've seen some consumer behavior shifts since around May over the course of the summer, as we saw consumers selectively splurging on some categories like summertime travel, yet then cutting back to find offsets elsewhere. So that's impacted our business in different ways. Our multi-serve business has been strong. Our single-serve uh, frozen business has been a little soft. So the consumer behaviors are, are there, they're noticeable. These are temporary shifts that the consumers are, are making in order to cover expenses that they were committed to like summertime travel. I think a lot of talk, Sean, has been that inflation is slowing, inflation is slowing, and it's slowing. But for a lot of households, they don't see it that way. And we have seen this trade down to private label goods. My question to you is, are we still at the point in this economy, looking through the lens of what you make, food, frozen food and snacks, that a family of, of four are just feeding themselves on two cans of chili? Yeah, we haven't seen a lot of trade down in our categories to private label. Uh, the, the one place where you tend to see more switching to private label are in commoditized categories. We don't have a lot of those. Uh, but what we have seen are consumers making behavior shifts in order to stretch their household balance sheet. So more meals for many, fewer meals for one. Uh, and that's different because consumers usually rely on single serve meals, convenience meals, uh, as a way to, to uh, manage their busy lifestyle. And we've seen a bit less of that over the summer, but it's a temporary phenomenon because we did know they were spending money on things like travel during the course of the summer, and they, they need to find some offsets. But we haven't seen a lot of interaction in our categories with store brands. Then given those trends, when, when does that frozen food business start to reaccelerate? Well, we already are seeing tremendous strength in parts of the frozen business and our multi-serve meal business. The single-serve meal business has been a juggernaut for us, as, as you know, for, for many years now. It's been growing at double digits, and that's all been on the back of innovation. So what we've got, what we've got coming this year in terms of our new innovation suite in frozen single-serve meals is tremendously exciting. We're going to rely on great brands like Bird's Eye, Marie Calendar, Healthy Choice, brands I, kn I know that you know well and, and use. And, you know, these are businesses that have been driving the growth in the overall frozen space for many years now where we're the largest player. I do know your brands very well, Sean. I, I eat them all the time. And I tell everyone frozen food has come a long way. Well, what's the next? What exactly is a single serve meal in, in the frozen aisle? What does that look like? Well, basically, at the core of what we do is we study the consumer because the one constant in food is that the consumer is always changing. So we ha we're basically got a group of demand scientists who are cultural anthropologists. They study constantly evolving consumer trends. We find out what the consumer is looking for. Then we design those attributes into all of our products. Frozen single serve meals is a big part of that. So the trends are different every year. We've seen keto. We've seen grain free. We've seen high protein. We've seen low carb. And so we're going to continue to study the consumer. We'll continue to be relentless in the innovation we bring into all of our brands, including our frozen single serve meals. Given the, the challenges that you've, you've laid out here, Sean, are, are retailers, a Kroger, a Walmart, a Target, some of your biggest customers, are they out there promoting more to drive more frequency with consumers? Well, volume is a little bit light, and there is some room for increased merchandising because if merchandising across the food industry in the last few years has been down quite a bit with all of the supply chain challenges coming out of COVID. Uh, that has improved. The supply chains have become more resilient. They're bouncing back to basically pre-pandemic levels. So I think what you're hearing from 
the, the companies in our space is that there is room to add more quality merchandising and everybody would like to move a little bit more volume. The key is to do that in a disciplined and responsible way. So we've got plans to do more of that in the year to go period, but the key is finding the sweet spot, being responsible. We are not looking to deep discount our brands uh, the way it was done in the old days. We've spent many years being focused on reducing those kinds of activities and putting more emphasis in terms of innovation, and that's where our priorities are. But we've got some room to do a little bit more in a high quality, high ROI way. Let me get back to inflation uh, real quick, Sean. What is your inflation outlook? Well, for the year for us, uh, it's about 3%. It was about 4.5% in our first quarter, which we just announced last week. So obviously, it's coming down, but it's not deflationary. You know, We still talk to folks who think that that we're seeing a net deflationary position. That's not the case. We're still at an elevated level of inflation versus what our company would typically experience in normal times of two to three uh, percent. But the the rate of the increase has come down. Keep in mind, we're over two years into the largest inflation uh, super cycle that I've seen in my 32 years in this business, and and it's good to see it coming down, but it has not uh, yet turned to negative. Lots of focus, like I mentioned at the top, Sean, on the impact to this industry, your industry, from Ozempic, Wagalvi, all sorts of these weight loss drugs that have really come out of, uh, really, out of, I would say, nowhere the past year and, and has helped a lot of people, but has, maybe has reduced their consumption. Do you believe this will fundamentally alter the next decade for your business? Well, we haven't seen any impact yet, and it's very early days, as you're probably hearing from most of the guests on your show. Uh, but people are trying to speculate, what will it eventually uh, become? Will it become prevalent? Uh, we think it's a ways off. Uh, again, we haven't seen any impact yet. But the way I think about it is we are in the business of studying consumer trends. We are in the business of innovating in new ways that do a better job of meeting consumer trends. And health has always been an important part of our playbook. One of our biggest brands, for example, is Healthy Choice, a brand that you know well. So if we were to encounter more U.S. consumers who are focused on eating a little bit healthier, maybe more portion control. We think we are super well positioned because we've got brands like Healthy Choice that are constantly evolving, that are low sugar, low salt, low fat options, but have vegetable nutrition, have a lot of protein, and have portion control. So it depends upon the mix of your portfolio, but we think we're very well positioned should these things become more meaningful uh, in the marketplace. Do you use this moment in time, you, know, you go back into, uh, you know, you hold a call with your demand scientists and say, hey, we need, need to reinvent our portfolio again. And what does that reinvention look like, Sean? Do you have to pull out certain ingredients do you take a frozen dinner and cut the size down in half? How should investors think about it? Yeah, I think the investors should think of what we do around here is not reinventing, it's constant evolution. You know, again, the one constant in the food space is change. The consumer's tastes are always changing. And if you're a great innovation shop, you're on top of those trends, you know how to design them into your products so that you can be out ahead of your competition with new solutions that meet their needs. So if you look at the brand Healthy Choice as an example, it meant one thing in the 80s, it meant something entirely different in the 90s, and then this century it's it's evolved, continued to evolve. We've moved from low fat to low sodium to low calorie to low sugar to grain free to keto to carb. It's constantly evolving to meet up with consumers' tastes. The packaging has also evolved and portion size has evolved. So these are things that we have been doing for years and years, and that work will continue and we'll just adapt to what the consumer is looking for. Sean, 15 seconds left. When did you start selling Wendy's chili uh, in a can? I saw that slide deck. This year, it's one of our uh, big innovations for the year. It's off to a rockin' start, and I suggest you go get some and enjoy it because it's an excellent product. Fair enough. We asked the uh, tough questions here. Sean Connolly, Conagra Brand CEO, always great to get some time with you. We'll talk to you soon. Good to talk to you. All right, and, uh, we will be right back. Minus the chili on Yahoo Finance. Stick around.
Welcome back. We had the opening bell on Wall Street just moments ago. There was a look at Birkenstock, ticker symbol B-I-R-K. Yep, they're waving the clogs. They got them in hand and on feet, I imagine, as well at the New York Stock Exchange for the IPO taking place down there. And here at the NASDAQ, right down below as we are celebrating International Day of the Girl, you can see lots of excitement there at the open as they counted down to the opening bell there just a few seconds ago. Lots of celebrity presence, as you can see up there around the podium. Yara Shahidi among them, also Lola Tung of Summer I Turned Pretty among the actresses there celebrating and honoring Day of the Girl here at the NASDAQ. Big fan. Let's do a quick check of the markets. Jared, what are you tracking this morning? Well, lots of celebrations going on. I think investors are celebrating the fact that we are in the midst of a four-day rally. Here is uh, the NASDAQ composite over the last four days, up three and a quarter percent. Let's check out the Dow. That's up a little bit less, 38 basis points today, up two and a quarter percent over the last four days. And let's take a look inside the market where we have real estate and utilities, uh, also tech and consumer discretionary. Lots of movement at the top right now, but the number one sector is real estate. Uh, that is defensive, but it's been uh, kind of knocked down recently by those climbing uh, rates. And guess what? Rates are moving in reverse today. So that's a little bit of a tailwind for some of these beaten down sectors. Now, healthcare and energy, those are the two in the red there. Energy off about one and a half percent. And just taking a quick look at the futures, uh, crude oil, WTI down about one percent. If you take a look at the price action over the last seven days, here is that big bump on the incursion in Gaza. And then we have basically sideways pr uh, trading action since then. Want to get a, a sense of our leadership here, and we are looking at mostly green. So even the fringier parts of the market are, so, are showing some love this morning. Uh, bets, that's a gambling ETF. That's in the forefront, followed by solar, meme stocks, Korean stocks, disruption, um, and also some others, home builders down the line. And if we take a look at what's happening inside the disruption, for instance, this is one of those fringy parts of the market. We can see there CRISPR's, excuse me, CRISPR Therapeutics up about one, two, three percent there, uh, six and a half percent over the last seven days. Uh, we're going to be looking forward to those big bank earnings with JP Morgan. JP Morgan this morning up about three quarters of a percent, Bank America up one percent, uh, probably taking advantage of the fact that the bond market showing a little bit less volatility. Now, where it gets dark is uh, in the energy sector. We're going to be talking about that uh, big pioneer transaction that Exxon has announced this morning. Uh, it's all stock, so we're seeing a bit of dilution uh, work its way through Exxon. You can see down 8% over the last seven days, 3.6% uh, today. But that's just taking in this deal, which was actually kind of leaked last week. And you can see it's off of those highs from earlier in the year considerably. Take a brief look at Pioneer itself, and let's see if I can find that. Well, it doesn't look like that's gonna pop up on my radar today. So let's close by taking a look at China. I'm gonna be doing a deep dive later in the show on what's going on there. New stimulus measures being rolled out, but uh, working, it looks like today, in the advancement of Li Auto, Xpeng, each of those up more than 3%, guys. All right, Jared Licker, thanks so much for the latest on that with this morning's opening moves here for the opening bell. All right, let's get to some of the individual movers. Novo Nordisk shares on the move this morning. Now, up, trading to the upside up nearly 3%, one of the company's most profitable drugs and something that the street is very excited about, Ozempic. It's good for weight loss. We know that. Diabetes and also could help with kidney failure, out this morning, the company is saying that the drug showed surprisingly early effectiveness in a kidney failure study. Now, this new development sending shares of dialysis providers tumbling. The drug maker will get full results of the study in the first half of next year. But we're seeing the pressure that this is putting on some of those other names that we just mentioned there. DaVita among those names that are under tremendous amount of pressure this morning. The thought there, at least from the street, that it could potentially threaten uh, the growth of targets from the company and pressure profitability if we continue to see the effectiveness and the second stage of this trial uh, confirms some of the early findings. Again, you're looking at DaVita off just about 15 percent this morning. So this drug, we know it's a huge uh, 
we've certainly seen the uptake very quickly yeah. across the U.S., across the world, potentially another treatment here that it could be used for. So very promising. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, when we think about it, and I'm not going to act like I'm a medical expert here, but at least reading through what Novo Nordisk had to say about this and the objective of what this trial was, it was basically just to try and demonstrate a delay in progression of what they, uh, what is effectively known in the medical community as CKD and lower risk of kidney and cardiovascular mortality through the preliminary endpoints consisting of a few different components here. And so uh, this, no doubt, huge for at least tracking the trials and making sure that um, just in the decision to stop the kidney outcomes trial flow, um, we'll, we'll see exactly how investors continue to, I don't know if you, you'd say play this space, but at least look at how much this has been kind of leaned into for some people who are looking for weight loss out there. Um, and I guess on the other side, too, where you think about those people that are also going to need, as it was coming up in the conversation that Sazi just had with ConAgra brands, on the other side of that, going to need some type of diets that also is more healthy at, at the end of the day. And so every company thinking about how they can address the broader market who's, who's looking to not just lose weight quick, but perhaps keep it off long term, too. Yeah, certainly. And we, we've seen the excitement in this doc in Nova Nordisk yeah. ever since the announcement of Ozempic, the wider adoption there, what it could do. Taking a look at the two-day chart, but if you take a look at year-to-date or even the last year, the, the one-year chart up just around 84%. So we certainly have seen this surge obviously coinciding with some of the excitement on the street and also Main Street as well when we talk yeah. about the adoption of the drug. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about those who have adoption of smart TVs in their homes. Samsung stock, that stock is on the move after the company released its third quarter profit guidance here. Let's take a look at shares. They're higher by about 2.7%. This is a stock that trades in uh, Korea. And so ultimately here, thinking about what this means, they anticipate their profit to drop by a smaller than expected 78%. That's showing signs of a recovery from a downturn. Samsung expects their operating profit to be over $1.7 billion is the U.S. equivalent there, slightly beating analyst expectations. This guidance reflects an 11.5% 11, 11 increase from their second quarter revenue figure here. Now, Samsung, of course, everything from the TVs and, of course, quipping about that at the beginning, but, of course, still the large player in this smartphone category as well here worldwide. And uh, our own Dan Halley was able to go kind of behind the scenes in one of our uh, editions of Next. People should check that out for sure. But at the end of the day here, I think for the growth that we've seen from some of the com competition where IDC expects Apple to get its largest market share ever this year, on the smartphone category here through the iOS users out there. Uh, for Samsung, this is going to have a direct correlation to where investors continue to play uh, this name internationally, at least. Yeah, well, and and I think that, yes, maybe this was a little bit better than expected, but you got to put this in yeah. perspective, right? We're still talking about a drop of just about 78%, nearly 80% on a year-over-year -year basis. So I think it is way too early to be talking about a comeback here for Samsung. Yeah. Clearly, we need to see a bigger rebound when we talk about the prices of these chips because we know chip makers have been cutting memory chip output this year in order to try to shore up some of that profitability. So, yes, we are seeing a bit of a reaction here to the upside today with shares up nearly 3 percent. But there's a long way to go to get back to those uh, levels that we had seen Previously, and we talk about the return of that, what that could potentially look like timeline, obviously taking a bit longer than what uh, forecasters had initially anticipated. All right, let's take a look at Exxon because shares are on the move today. News this morning, Exxon Mobil agreeing to buy shale company Pioneer Natural Resources for over $59 billion in an all-stock deal. Now, this is Exxon's biggest deal since the late 1990s. The deal is expected to close in the first half of 2024. And we talked about the fact that when this was initially reported, what this means for Exxon's business. We know Exxon had really set its sights on the Permian Basin, talked about the importance of that region, what that's going to do for its business down the line. So with this deal, Exxon will now be the largest player in the Permian Basin. It's going to bring daily production to nearly four and a half million barrels a day, about 50% more than the next supplier. So yeah. we're seeing some excitement 
Although Exxon under a bit of pressure, obviously, that tends to happen when you talk about a deal, especially of this magnitude, but those longer term targets obviously could be a huge win here for Exxon. Yeah, the company making the acquisition, you typically see that type of reaction in the stock as you were pointing out, but this is a huge merger and what this does is really bring together the space that you, you talked about that Midland Basin and how important that is. 850,000 net acres is what Pioneer has and so ultimately combining that with the 570,000 net acres in Delaware and Midland Basins that Exxon Mobil had plus uh, really bringing together the 16 billion barrels of oil equivalent, equivalent in the uh, Permian, all of this considered, you, you start thinking about what this means in terms of the volume that investors are going to be looking for these companies to talk about in production. They're expecting that to increase to approximately two um, MOBD, um, uh, I forget the exact acronym uh, breakdown there, but ultimately it's just talking about how that volume is set to increase as well by 2027 here. Um, so even greater opportunity is what they see. We'll see if that plays out long term here for investors as well. We certainly will. Again, Exxon's largest takeover since the takeover of Mobile Corp back in the 1990s, around just around 1999. It's also the largest takeover deal since the start of the year. Well, we got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Shares of LVMH fell to its lowest level of the year today after the luxury brand saw revenue slow more than expected in the third quarter. The business grappling with an underwhelming China reopening and also a pullback in U.S. sales and digging into some of these numbers, why we're looking at the stock off just about 5 percent. Well, sales growing just about 9 percent in the third quarter. That's down from 17 percent growth in the previous quarter. So certainly a massive uh, moderation here in terms of sales. And also, I think more broadly, the takeaway here is what this could signal about the luxury consumer market, the consumer industry over the next couple of months. We talk about the fact that the U.S. economy might be weakening, consumers pulling back on spending. The U.S. was one of the spots that did see some weakness there. LVMH did see some weakness as well as Europe in in terms of the softer than expected sales. So what this could signal about some of the other competitors within this space when you're thinking about Kering, which is the owner of Gucci and some of those other higher end products, the fact that we might start to see a bit of a deterioration and the luxury consumer, it's a bit concerning here when you talk about the broader economy. All brands I aspire to have in my closet don't yet, but hey, maybe they're tough. One day. One day. Bain & Company actually had an interesting look at the luxury landscape, and, and they published it at the midpoint of this year and looked ahead to the back half of this year. And there's this correlation between some of the luxury spending and travel. Luxury shopping in the U.S. is slowing down, they noted, due to economic uncertainties, while Europe was actually on the rise thanks to tourism. So tourism driving some of the luxury spending and this was a big year where some of the reinitiation of that cross-border travel as we've heard about it from not only the U.S. airlines here, Delta, American Airlines, some of those that go International United um, or have partnerships therein and how all of those luxury companies that we just showed on the screen there were also pointing to that luxury traveler or that tourist traveler having more of a propensity to spend perhaps while they are there. But Look across the categories here, and this could be interesting to track here because there are little luxuries even within luxury. Top performing categories, they've continued to include watches and jewelry, customers looking for less but better purchases here. So that less but better could point to some of the little luxuries versus some of the kind of larger purchases that people have made in the past, uh, especially on luxury vehicles too. Yeah, that, that's a good point. When we talk about the buying patterns there and exactly what people are spending on and what people are not spending on. So we are seeing a bit of a negative reaction, or not a bit, we are seeing a negative reaction in the stock price today. But there are still some analysts out there on the street who are saying this might be an overreaction when we talk about the pressure that some of these stocks have been under in recent weeks. Bernstein, one of those names, one of the analysts out there in the street, saying that the sector correction has been overly done, also adding that they are spending on marketing, they're easing up on the price increases, and that is among the reasons that make them best placed in an uncertain economic environment. So we'll see whether or not buying picks up here in the very, very critical holiday quarter for the company. I was just looking at Canada Goose. We had that on the screen a moment ago here. Canada Goose is down like 20% year to date here. And the problem there within that luxury play is that you buy one Canada Goose jacket, how many more do you need? Or how many more do you want to buy? I mean, I'm still looking for a dry cleaner to be able to clean the one that I bought several years ago at this point. So if you know a good one, let me know. But at the end of the day, I think that's what's really the the, the closet replenishment rate could be one of the hindrances in terms of the way forward, at least in the back half this year, especially if you do see more of those dollars continue to go into the experience economy out there. Well, now it would be when you're buying a new winter coat, yeah. at least here. So yeah, true. we could see the sales tick up just a bit in the holiday period. Yeah, that's true. Right. All right, all it's your markets. I see that you have one. Uh, you know, I thought it was too. Yeah. And now well, you said, well, apparently you spilled something all over it and might have ruined it. So yeah, it doesn't look great Money right not now. Not well spent. Yeah, it's murky at best. <laughs> all your markets action ahead, live from the Nasdaq market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We might be on Cornelia Street right now, but Taylor Swift is definitely not heartbroken. From a $5 billion tour to a new movie on the big screen, Taylor Swift is all anyone can talk about. And her superstardom is expanding beyond the Billboard charts and having an unheard impact on the U.S. economy. From increasing viewership for the NFL to getting blamed for inflation, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style. And we have all the details for you right here on Yahoo Finance.
No, it was hilarious, but it's we're live from the NASDAQ market side. Everyone, you're watching Yahoo Finance Live. The second week of SBF, Sam Bankman Fried's trial. We're all underway here on Tuesday. Sam Bankman Fried's ex girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, took to the stand for around four hours, detailing how the former CEO of FTX allegedly arranged for billions in customer funds to back risky investments. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith for more on this developing story. You got the SBF beat here today, David. What do we know? Yeah, so Brad, uh, Ellison's a top lieutenant and was an occasional uh, intimate partner of Makeman Freed. And so her testimony has been the jury's closest look um, at the decision making that went on uh, between FTX and Alameda and ultimately um, to help us and the jury understand what led to FTX's collapse last November. Um, in Ellison's testimony yesterday, she was adamant that Bankman Freed was complicit in the massive fraud that FTX and Alameda committed. Ellison, who is the former CEO of Alameda Research, this is the hedge fund um, that allegedly had spent customer funds of FTX and sort of created the situation that led to the bankruptcy. Um, she she pleaded guilty to seven counts in December, and Bankman Freed uh, has denied all of those uh, charges as of now. Um, like in uh, yesterday's earlier testimony from uh, co-founder Gary Wang, Ellison claimed um, that Bankman Freed was the ultimate decision maker between what was going on between between the two firms. She said that Bankman Freed was not only aware that Alameda was using customer funds, but that she he'd specifically instructed her to do so. Uh, and this essentially looked like an unlimited uh, line of credit that she said um, Alameda could draw upon in, to make their own investments. Um, and you know uh, the problem here is that uh, the balance sheet of Alameda was ultimately uh, held up by coins that FTX either created or promoted. And uh, Ellison said that she was also instructed to borrow uh, funds from crypto lenders. And by Bankman Fried, she was told to make uh, Alameda's balance sheet appear less risky. Uh, she's also um, she's also on the stand today, and we're going to get more into sort of the details of the trading that went on at Alameda. And in terms of the, de the decision making and where it fell down, uh, part of the prosecutor, part of the defense's angle is sort of to push off responsibility on Bankman Freed that he was not connected to. And pointing to that, uh, yesterday Ellison had said that Bankman Freed had told her that Alameda was not a good brand and he did not want it connected to his name. He also got upset with Ellison when she uh, discussed with people outside of the firm. Uh, the reliance that they had on these crypto tokens that they created uh, that's uh, sort of propped up their balance sheet. So that's what we have from yesterday. And David, when you briefly mentioned this, it's the second day of Ellison's testimony today. What else are we expecting to hear and who else are we expecting to hear from in the coming days? Yeah, so today uh, we're expecting to get more details on the actual uh, trading, uh, who was making the decisions. Um, we don't have uh, you know, a full account of anything like uh, uh, Bankman Freed saying, saying you know, uh, to use customer funds. There is a quote of, him, of, of Ellison saying that he, he, she was allowed to draw on the credit line as long as it didn't affect customer with withdrawals. So we'll want to get into that more. Um, there's also testimony uh, that the prosecutors have set up for uh, to bring on uh, BlockFi CEO or former CEO uh, Zach Prince, as well as a former Alameda uh, developer. Those are the next two witnesses. There's also talk of a, a Ukrainian FTX customer coming on the stand, but that may be put down given that he would have to call in remotely. That was certainly a trial. We will continue to watch. David Holler, thanks. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith here at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day here. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. First, stocks are up this morning after a hot inflation print. Producer prices for September came in higher than expected, rising half a percent month over month and 2.2 percent year over year. Investors now await Fed minutes coming this afternoon and consumer prices on Thursday. Well, taking a look at individual names, we're watching Morgan Stanley shares this morning. The banking giant getting a downgrade to neutral from buy at UBS. Analysts there saying that they see little upside from the stock's current levels given the challenging environment. This comes as Morgan Stanley is set to release its third quarter fiscal results next Wednesday before the bell. And we're also watching Boeing this morning as the stock is moving higher after UBS initiated coverage of the company with a buy rating and $275 price target. It's about 40% higher than the current trading price, about $198 right now. Boeing released its deliveries for Q3 on Tuesday, showing a drop in its best-selling 737 MAX due to an ongoing effort to fix a manufacturing defect. This was offset by a significant amount of new orders in September. We also have our eyes on Polestar, the stock falling today after the Swedish EV maker announced its intentions to raise a billion dollars. Now, the company filed a shelf registration with the Securities and Exchange Commission, giving them the option to sell shares if necessary. Now, software delays and increased competition have caused Polestar to struggle to gain a market share in the EV space. Let's get to our call of the day or market analysis. A potential economic downturn has been a topic of discussion among economists, analysts, and investors since the pandemic recovery began. But continued growth and resilient consumers have kept fears at bay. Now, with a war raging between Israel and Hamas, Yardeni Research is saying that there is an increase in the risk of a recession by the end of next year. A no doubt from Ed Yardeni saying, quote, The prospects of a prolonged war in the Middle East heighten the chance of a recession in the U.S. That's not our base case outlook, but we are raising the odds that we see of a recession before year end of 2024 to 30%. That's up from 25%. Now, Yardeni also saying that he does not see the war ending anytime soon and warns that Iran's involvement could raise the possibility of its spreading, leading to sanctions and higher oil prices, which could then in turn trigger a global recession. So, Brad, most of this call, based on the last two lines there that I read, what this means for potential sanctions on Iran, what that could then do to oil prices as a result, if we could see a move significantly over 100 bucks a barrel, obviously that would put pressure not only here on the U.S., but globally speaking. That's all points to the potential here, the risk of a global recession. But he did point out that it is more likely that Saudi Arabia would increase production to keep that price below 100 bucks a barrel. You know, all this said, it really kind of harkens back to our discussion that we were having with the KPMG U.S. CEO, Paul Knopp, last week, who had said one of the biggest jumps that they had seen in their annual survey in terms of what CEOs are looking at and the risks to their business Mm -hmm. was in geopolitical tensions. And that jumped from number seven in terms of political uncertainty all the way to number one. And what they really were noting here in this shift is that CEOs have to come to grips with the fact that geopolitical risk is not only a short-term consideration, but in a fragmented world, CEOs have to become de facto political players as well here. And so that's going to be considerably interesting to watch play out here, especially given the risks that you were just mentioning and how this puts pressure on commodities that all of these businesses rely on. But then additionally, where these businesses also have to make sure that they've got a pulse on not just the environments that they're operating in, but then additionally, the consumer at the other end of that too. Uh, Plus, of course, there is still the human aspect that we should be starting and ending each of these conversations with. And that amazingly important. We heard that even in our discussion with the Pepsi CFO, Hugh Johnston, speaking about his soda stream employees uh, that are in Israel and them uh, and those that are affected as of right now. And so continuing to keep a pulse on their own employees as well as understanding how to navigate through an environment like this too. Also here, Republican lawmakers should be gathering behind closed doors as we speak to uh, as we speak to select their candidate for Speaker of the House. Among the two declared candidates, Representative Steve Scalise from Louisiana and Representative Jim Jordan from Ohio. There is no clear front runner right now. According to a report from Punchbowl News, Jordan wouldn't commit to backing Scalise if he were to win the speaker nomination, 
Boscolese says he would vote for Jordan if the situation were reversed. We could be headed for a long voting process. And here to give his insights is Andrew Desiderio, who is the Punchbowl News senior congressional reporter here. Andrew, um, okay, just another day in D.C., um, but at the end of the day, this is one unlike any other where we're watching a party and ultimately some of the largest leaders or most kind of boisterous and loud leaders in their party try to get this speakership. Is there, is there a front runner right now? Well, to your point uh, at the outset, no, there is no clear front runner right now. And what Republicans are trying to avoid is that sort of embarrassing scenario we saw on the House floor back in January when they were first trying to elect a speaker, where they had to go through 15 rounds of voting uh, just to get to Kevin McCarthy eventually in the end. What they're trying to do now is decide on a candidate behind closed doors, see if someone can get a majority and make sure that everyone else would fall in line behind that person. Uh, on the floor so that they don't have to go through multiple rounds of voting on the floor. The goal is to just go through one round, have enough Republicans voting for this person, uh, and sort of move on to the, the business of legislating. Andrew, is there a risk here? And I guess what are the chances that neither Jordan nor Scalise are able to get the votes that they need? And we could be talking about a potential uh, lawmaker that has not been in the cards yet. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility here. Uh, Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, is currently the acting speaker pro tem, uh, which is not a, uh, a permanent position by any means for him. However, he is someone who uh, could be looked at to be uh, a, a permanent speaker, at least uh, in the short term, uh, while Republicans figure out uh, who their who their uh, speaker is going to be for the rest of this Congress. McHenry is very well respected uh, on both sides of the political aisle, frankly. Uh, and he has uh, has allies in both the more conservative wings of the Republican Party as well as the moderates. Uh, but he has said he doesn't want the job. Uh, but again, to your point, if if neither Jordan nor Scalise can lock up the votes uh, and we're at a stalemate here, people might look to Patrick, Patrick McHenry or someone like him who has that sort of stature within the Republican Party, within the House of Representatives, of course, too, uh, to 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 temporarily lead uh, lead the House. What, what are Democrats doing in the meantime here, Andrew? I mean, <laughs> when you think about what's taking place to try and find the next speaker from the party that holds the most seats. At the same time, Democrats had voted once before to make sure that they could at least put a speaker in place prior to that because they were just saying, okay, let's just all get behind this one person. So what are they doing kind of on the side of this? Right. So last night, House Democrats unanimously uh, nominated Hakeem Jeffries to be their candidate for speaker. No surprise, obviously, he's the Democratic leader. He's the House minority leader. Uh, what Jeffries has been pitching some of the more traditional Republicans on is this idea of a bipartisan governing coalition, whereby some of them would vote for uh, Hakeem Jeffries for speaker to give him the records at votes. Uh, and then in exchange, those Republicans might get some powerful committee positions, leadership positions, uh, or other concessions. Right now, that's looking exceedingly unlikely. Um, but uh, again, anything could happen here. And as we go on and, you know, Republicans, if they're still at a stalemate over this, uh, I, I think it's a, a possibility that you'll see Hakeem Jeffries and his leadership team reaching out to some of the more moderate uh, Republicans within the GOP conference uh, to try to form some sort of governing coalition, especially if, you know, there becomes a more urgent need for Congress to do something, for example, related to Israel. Uh, the members of the House just got a classified briefing this morning uh, from top administration officials about the needs that Israel is going to have in the coming weeks and months uh, from the United States. And while there is no imminent uh, request for uh, assistance uh, from Congress, the administration made it clear that, 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 that such a package will be necessary at some point. Uh, and if, you know, God forbid, we're still locked in the speaker fight uh, over the next few weeks, uh, that that might be a, a solution that some people are looking toward, especially if there's an urgent legislative need on something like Israel, which has broad bipartisan support. Andrew, digging a little bit deeper into that, just in terms of what can be done, what cannot be done if we still don't have a speaker when it comes to giving aid to Israel. Any insight there? Because there has been lots of talk that maybe there is a way around it to be able to get Israel more aid, even without a speaker being named yet? Well, the administration has a lot of existing authorities they can use to transfer some weapons and other equipment over to Israel. They've already done that so far this week. I believe the president said yesterday 
that uh, the first tranche of U.S. weapons has already arrived uh, in Israel. But, you know, ex eventually those fun those authorities are going to expire. You know, the president has access to what's called presidential drawdown authority, which is which allows him to uh, basically draw from U.S. existing U.S. stockpiles of weapons and give them to other allied nations. Uh, the problem is that that is at a certain cap uh, in terms of a dollar value. And once you run into that cap, then Congress needs to authorize more. And without a speaker, uh, it's very hard to do that. There's been talk maybe of passing some sort of symbolic resolution in support of Israel this week, even without a speaker. Uh, but to, to be frank with you, I'm not even sure that something like that could pass muster with the House rules, uh, given that it is technically legislation. And if you don't have a speaker, the business of the House must be on electing a speaker, nothing else. OK. And so what are the key dates, timelines here that we, we should be keeping an eye on, Andrew? Well, look, Republicans are going to try today to settle on someone for speaker and then go to the floor as soon as tomorrow. Um, that is, I guess, the best case scenario we're looking at right now. Worst case scenario is we're looking at something that lasts multiple days, multiple weeks, and Republicans are in, you know, complete disarray and unable to coalesce behind uh, a speaker. Uh, I think it'll uh, be be really telling over the next few hours in terms of uh, who can get uh, a majority of the vote, and then whether the people who voted for the person who lost will then just fall in line and vote for the person who won on the floor. Uh, and that, and as of right now, uh, that is not uh, a guarantee. All right. Well, we will be watching Andrew D. Sidario, Punchbowl News. Apologies there, Punchbowl News senior congressional reporter. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks. All your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We might be on Cornelia Street right now, but Taylor Swift is definitely not heartbroken. From a $5 billion tour to a new movie on the big screen, Taylor Swift is all anyone can talk about. And her superstardom is expanding beyond the Billboard charts and having an unheard impact on the U.S. economy. From increasing viewership for the NFL, to getting blamed for inflation, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style. And we have all the details for you right here on Yahoo Finance.
Emerging market stocks sinking to its lowest level in 36 years relative to the S&P 500 after Israel's retaliation against Hamas. Investors fear a broader conflict between the U.S. and Iran. More on emerging market stocks. We've got Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickley. Hey, Jared. Hi, Brad. And when you say the lowest level, that's uh, the chart that we're looking at right here. This is the MSCI Emerging Markets uh, Index versus the S&P 500. It's a ratio. It goes all the way back to uh, 1990. When it's going higher, that means the emerging markets are outperforming the U.S. And when it's going lower, as it has been for over a decade, that means that emerging markets are sinking, are actually underperforming the U.S. And now we just hit the lowest level uh, in this data set. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, strength of the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. has some of the highest interest rates in the developed world. And this is a U.S. dollar index chart over the last two years. What you can see is the trends are largely up. And we're just finishing uh, another up leg right here. I don't want to say finish. It could continue. Uh, but this uh, latest up leg has really given a lot of stocks, uh, not only emerging markets, but also in the U.S., some trouble here, commodities and cryptocurrencies as well. So let me go and show you the currencies. This is the U.S. dollar year to date versus all these different world currencies, not exhausted. But you can see the United States dollar is up 98 percent, basically doubled versus the Argentine peso. That is very that is ouch. Is, uh, I think that's the only word I have for that. Then we have the Turkish lira. The U.S. dollar has advanced 50 percent versus that. Then you have the ruble, Japanese yen, the Israeli shekel, and then also the South African rand. Uh, so all of this strength weighs on these currencies. And so what you end up with is a situation where they're largely mean reverting. Now, let me show you some of the world indices. This is also calculated year to date. Uh, in the lower part, uh, you will see that Jakarta, that is uh, down actually about 12 percent year to date. You can also see some weakness in Malaysia. That's down 4 uh, percent. You go up a line and South Africa, we were just talking about the rand sinking versus versus the dollar. That uh, stock market has barely treaded water, just up 1% this year. Uh, but for that matter, the Russell 2000 is right there with it. Uh, Mexico is up about 3%. Brazil, interesting story. Let's take a look at the five-year chart. They were one of the first to raise interest rates among the emerging markets. In fact, in the entire world in 2021. And you can see, as a result, rather than going down, at least they've been going sideways over the last few years. And they are up a bit this year. You can see 6%. And then a similar story for the Bombay Stock Exchange, except that's largely from the lower left to the upper right. Um, let me just close here and show you some of our other heat maps with regard to China. I'm going to be doing a deep dive, so I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, but when you do consider emerging markets, uh, you have to consider that China is usually lumped in with them. And so if you separate China out, you get a different picture. Now, this right here is emerging markets with China versus the S&P 500. The S&P 500, this cyan line up here, manifestly outperforming the EEM stocks. And then finally, EM versus China, not too much of a difference, but it really has widened this year. China dragging the indices down. And when you take out China, a little bit better performance, guys. All right, great insight there, Jared. Thanks. Well, let's talk about the latest on EVs because EV charging stations are in high demand and the industry is racing to keep up. The number of charging ports in the national station locator was 3.2 percent in the first quarter, and that's expected cont to continue to climb. But range anxiety is still prevalent amid fear that the charging infrastructure is far short of what's necessary for wider EV adoption. Here to talk about that, we want to bring in Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO, as well as Joel Levin, Plug in America Executive Director. Great to have you both here with us today. Joel, let me start with you. Plug in America, for those who aren't familiar, it's a nonprofit that promotes the use of EVs. I'm curious from your perspective, how would you describe the current state of the charging network here in the U.S.? Well, um, it, it's a mix. Uh, you know, most people charge at home uh, and they use the charging network mainly for longer trips. Uh, the public charging network, EV drivers are not very happy with it. Uh, there's, uh, we did a survey this year uh, that showed that drivers are generally dissatisfied with the public charging network. The Tesla network, on the other hand, where about half of EV drivers drive Teslas, people are pretty happy with the Tesla network. So um, it's sort of a mixture of the two. Um, the federal government is in the process of rolling out their NAVI program that would create uh, charging along major highways along the whole US. And the 
the standards for NEBI are pretty robust. And so if they're able to implement that program as it's designed, we think that public charging should improve a lot over the next couple of years. Brendan, how, how significant is it that you have more auto manufacturers that are deciding, okay, we can all kind of use Tesla as, as a standard here. And what does that mean for adoption, especially when you think about the network that we have right now and, and vehicle owners just trying to make sure that they're gonna have the ability to charge anywhere they need to, regardless of what type of, of plug that they've got? Yeah, it, it's really not a very relevant statistic. And, and the meaning, what we mean by that is the EV industry globally has structurally adjusted. In the US, Tesla is a bit of a phenomenon in terms of the charging network, but in Europe, the Tesla standard is banned. So what that means is the folks that develop cables and connectors, they've matured independently. And it's not a big issue to put a NAX as what Tesla calls that standard uh, cable and connector onto a charger. We've done it, we've done it successfully. That version of a charger for Blink goes into production in November and December this year. So that's not really a big issue. And what we really need to focus on is what the charging world demands. And according to McKinsey, according to Price Cooper's Waterhouse, Bloomberg, and a multiplicity of other surveys, the dominant amount of charging takes place on L2 charging, 90 plus percent. And this statistic has not waned over the last 15 years since I've been doing this. So we, we expect that. When we talk about DC fast charging, that's for those exceptional trips. That's for when you're going on the quarter, you're going to grandma's house, and that represents 90% or less. So we have two th things that are challenging us. First, we have to say that the standards issue is not a big deal. The industry will take care of that. And secondarily, that we have to break the dominant paradigm of charging and saying you don't have to go to depot or fueling station. You can charge at work, you can charge at home, you can charge at your doctor's office or the grocery store. Brendan, how confident then are you that the infrastructure can keep up with EV adoption? When we talk about what this is going to look like five, 10 years from now, what do you think the charging networks could potentially look like? Yeah, so if you look at what we need, and this is at 35% penetration by 2030, right? So California is actually at 23% EV penetration. We need about 30 million chargers out there in both private and public. The split's about 28 uh, million of those need to be in private situations, that's multifamily dwelling, private garages, in, in in-home. And then the other remaining percent is public. So we have now developed throughout this entire industry, the capacity to produce those chargers. If you look at some of the DOE data and the loans they've given for charging manufacturing companies relocating in the United States, it's simply outstanding numbers. Blink has just brought online a new facility in Maryland that will soon to be announced, but ups our capacity on L2 exclusively in the US to up to 50,000 uh, units per year. And we're gonna see that even double over the next three and four years. So we're gonna meet the challenge of capacity, but to the other point, we're also simultaneously doubling down on quality. There's no question that some of the legacy chargers that we'll put out over the last 10 to 15 years need to be re-looked at, some need to be ripped out, and the quality needs to improve. But really, we need to focus on breaking this assumption that you have to go to a gas station to fuel. You don't, you go home to fuel, and the reliability on those chargers is really, really good. Joel, what is the next step that you would like to see from the federal government in terms of prioritizing the network and make sure, making sure that there is more access for drivers? Right. Uh, I think I would say two things. Uh, number one is uh, the consumer experience. So not just focusing on building out the network, uh, but that the consumer experience is really positive. So um, when you look at, let's say, the gas station experience, not that, not that we're big advocates of, of buying gasoline, but the gas station experience, uh, when, when a consumer goes there, it's a pretty reliable, consistent experience. Uh, the pumps always work. They always take a credit card. The, the price is posted. Um, it's, it's well lit. It's covered. Uh, it's a pretty positive experience. Um, I'd like to see the charging experience be at least that good when you go to a public charging uh, station. Uh, so that's number one, is that the consumer experience is is positive and easy for EV drivers. Uh, and then second, I think we need to really focus on 
the challenge for people who live in apartments. So Brendan's absolutely right. The, the bulk of people charge at home and the home charging experience is pretty good and pretty easy. Um, I charge in my own driveway and it's, it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, but if you live in an apartment, it's not. And so I, I think there needs to be more energy put into um, addressing the issue for apartment dwellers. And it's, it's not a simple problem. It's probably the single most challenging problem we have in the EV space. And it's gonna be a mixture of uh, doing retrofits on older buildings, uh, getting building codes in place for construction of newer buildings, uh, creating more public charging that's close to where people live, um, and um, some some DC fast charging, and then also charging at work. A lot of times for people who can't charge at home, charging at work can be a great option as well. So there's there's kind of a whole range of solutions, but but definitely for the you know roughly half of Americans who live in apartments. Uh, charging is is more challenging than for people who live in a single family house. You know, I just want to end on a prediction here from from both of you. And, and Joel, I'll go to you first since you ended on the thought there. Um, when do you believe that we could potentially start to scratch the surface of not just widespread EV adoption, but really see this in, in critical mass, uh, critical mass, excuse me, among the American public? Well, I would say that it's happening now and it's happening really rapidly. Um, it's going to be in different uh, places at different times. So for example, in uh, larger urban areas, there's a lot of EVs out there and it's growing very rapidly. Uh, in rural areas, it's harder because historically the the EV, the cars that people wanna drive that have not been electric up until now, but that's changing um, very quickly as we're getting more pickups and larger EVs out there. So I would say that it depends where you live, but uh, in larger areas, sure. it's it's happening right now very quickly. And, and Brendan, very quickly, the same question to you with, with this added note of, I mean, one of the other major players in this charge point just had to raise $232 million in order to support their path to profitability. H how much more liquidity needs to be injected into companies as well that are bringing this to life in order to be profitable? in this endeavor so yeah, on, on the the first the last question there you asked there's no question that we need to create sustainable business models and at blink we're working towards that right now we have a a a bit of positive number we put out there by december 2024 so we have to create sustainable companies and blink is working to that others in the industry are working on that but you know you do need that investment dollar today those capital dollars to make the future of tomorrow come true. But, you know, to the other uh, question, we're seeing the growth, right? It's just now we have to do that growth at a profitable level. We have to focus on business fundamentals and make sure we're making the right type of investments to create sustainable charging infrastructure from uh, the US and in the Europe. But the numbers are very positive. Uh, as we referenced earlier in this call, with 22% plus in growing sales in California, which is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. That's a strong indicator of where it's going. Now, Blink has the advantage. We have three business units in Europe, and we're already much higher than that at the penetration rate in some of the companies we operate. So we look at Europe, and we have some predictability uh, on what's going to happen in the U.S., especially in the major metros, as was just referenced. So that's where the growth, but the trickle-down effect is starting to happen. And then look towards the OEMs. And, you know, when I started this, we were selling Nissan Leafs. Uh, and that was a subcompact car. Now we've got a car and a vehicle for every segment with a multiplicity of offerings with ranges up to four and, and 450 miles. We've taken range anxiety out by building new charging infrastructures and we're gonna continue to do that. So we say the, uh, the future is very, very bright. Uh, we need investments, uh, but we also need yeah. to work on the fundamentals of sustainability and profitability for all the companies, Blink included. All right, gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Brendan Jones, Blink Charging CEO and President, and Joel Levin, who is the Plug in America Executive Director, joining us here. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. 
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Bank earnings kick off this week with some big hitters. JP Morgan, Citi, Wells Fargo, all set to report before the bell Friday. Investors are going to be closely watching banks, lending businesses particularly. Activity has slowed in recent months thanks to tighter standards and reduced demand as a result of rapid interest rate hikes. In a note, Bank of America analysts predict JPM, JP Morgan, best position to handle the higher for longer environment, while there's some skepticism around Wells Fargo. Also in focus, higher bond yields, which 
could be particularly problematic for banks with large volumes of securities on their books. With more on what to watch from banks this quarter, we've got Polo Roca, who is the reporter at American Banker. Great to have you here this morning with us. All right, so biggest winner that you're expecting to emerge from this bank portion of the earnings season? You know, I think, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan is right. I think uh, it seems uh, analysts think they're the best position to, ha to handle this higher for longer rate environment. Um, you know, I'd say generally speaking, though, um, the banking industry is going to report some profitability challenges. Um, they're set to report that they made less money uh, this last quarter than they did the quarter before, which is less than they made the quarter before. And, you know, these uh, challenges, I think, are, are, you know, they're still making money, but they're going to report uh, less profits for the next couple of quarters, I think. Um, and so I, I think uh, analysts are really kind of trying to figure out this quarter, you know, when does that end? You know, kind of when does that pressure um, fade uh, and, um, you know, Will there be some sort of catalyst for um, bank investors to jump back into the sector because they haven't really uh, liked it so much this year? Paul, what do you expect to see on the deposit side of things? We obviously know this has been it's always a focal point when it comes to bank earnings, but even especially here within the last couple of quarters, given the fallout that we saw in some of the regional banks and also this need uh, for some of these banks to pay higher in order, uh, pay more to those depositors. What are some of the trends that you'll be looking at this quarter? Um, so generally speaking, you know, I think um, bank deposits uh, are, are fairly stable. You know, I think uh, that they might still be dropping here and there over the coming months as uh, the Fed kind of continues to uh, wind down its balance sheet. But, you know, really uh, the, the problem deposits wise for banks is how much they're paying for those deposits. Um, you know, when interest rates were at basically zero, uh, banks didn't really have to do that much. You know, they didn't have to compensate their depositors all that much. Um, that really has started changing, um, uh, you know, started changing last year and uh, picked up even more so this year. Uh, you know, there's money market funds that, you know, pay, you know, five and a half percent to people and, and uh, corporations that are just looking to park their cash somewhere. So, you know, banks are facing a, a little bit more competition. There's more competition uh, among banks uh, to uh, pay more to depositors. Um, you know, that pressure is still continuing. It, it seems to be ebbing a bit. Uh, you know, I think uh, some of those um, pressures are, are, are um, accelerating a little bit less but you know I, I think you know with interest rates um uh you know potentially still rising but at the very least staying high for a while um that pressure won't really die down until um maybe the fed starts cutting rates and and that seem that date seems to be uh, getting pushed further and further ahead so um you know on the expense side of things banks interest expenses are, are going to continue rising for uh quite a while particularly here polo when we think about what the largest banks could say that will give investors some inclination or at least some type of kind of thought process that begins to emerge around some of the regional or the smaller banks as well. Is there anything that you expect to hear that does place further spotlight on the stability of some of the regional or smaller banks once they report later on this quarter? Um, you know, I think uh, by and large, the kind of stability situation and, and the kind of health of, of regional banks, kind of all of that has, uh, you know, we, we were kind of in uh, somewhat of a panic mode, right, in March and April, um, and some banks mm -hmm. were particularly affected. All of that has really um, kind of eased, you know, never say never, you know, uh, but, um, you know, I think if, if I were to watch something um, that might read into um, kind of how regional or smaller banks might do is, you know, what banks say about um, just the the health of the economy, the health of the consumer. You know, we're seeing people uh, fall behind on uh, their you know car payments, their credit cards. Uh, you know, some businesses maybe are, are having some uh, troubles as well. Um, none of that is is all that dire at the moment. But to the extent that banks, um, that big banks, uh, see trouble ahead, um, you know, maybe that that's not so good for regional banks that maybe have. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe smaller cushion to to withstand those pressures. And, you know, I'd say the office space as well, you know, um, uh, you know, I think smaller lenders uh, are relatively um, more of their loan portfolio is tied to office uh, in many cases or in some cases. So, you know, if banks are starting to see some trouble with um, office, uh, you know, kind of semi empty office leases, um, uh, you know, kind of coming to a head, um, you know, to the extent that um, a smaller regional bank has more office loans on their books, um, they might start to uh, face some pressure. But I think, you know, generally, um, investors have kind of priced in a a, um, a kind of bad scenario for banks. So um, uh, I, I don't know what that means for their stock, but, you know, they've been hit pretty hard already. So, um, you know, I think um, to a certain extent, investors are prepared for 
a relatively bad scenario. Well, when it comes to credit quality, kind of tied with what you were just saying, what's going on in the commercial real estate landscape right now, I guess who is most exposed at this point when more specifically when we're talking about the larger banks and how big of an issue are investors, how big of a risk are investors viewing this at this point? Because it seems like a lot of that chatter has died down in recent weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've been trying to figure out, you know, kind of whether um, the the whole issue is is um, overhyped or maybe there's kind of a, a gradual, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the pressure is, is kind of leases come due on office uh, is more gradual over the next couple of years or something. You know, I'd say by and large, um, you know, kind of looking at the the, the banks that we track, uh, you know, uh, national, regional, uh, small banks, um, they certainly are seeing some... Um, you know, signs of, of trouble, but, you know, I, I think they're all pretty, looking pretty closely at their portfolios and not really seeing uh, major stress. You know, I think Wells Fargo, uh, you know, has kind of uh, raised some kind of alarms here and there, but, um, you know, it really, it, it really just kind of comes down to looking at an individual property, looking at its tenants, you know, uh, looking at, you know, the kind of uh, amenities the building has, right, that, you know, maybe a newer building with with nicer amenities um, is, is a bigger draw to some companies and you know or if you have uh, medical office space right you know those tenants um you know um, doctors uh, dentists can't work from home so um you know i think the banks are kind of looking very closely at their portfolios and and seeing kind of what exposures they have um right now I, you know I, I think they certainly see some signs of that caution but um you know i think regulators have given them some flexibility to kind of work out um, any properties that are under distress. And, you know, there, there is some chunk of um, private uh, investor money out there that might come in if, if a property is kind of in trouble, right? Uh, that kind of fixes potential issues. Uh, but, you know, so far, uh, certainly it's, it's, it's a risk on the horizon and one the banks are looking at. But, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know that we have an, an answer just yet on what that might look like. All right, well, we'll hear from Wells Fargo as well as JP Morgan and City before the bell on Friday. Polo Rocha, always great to get your perspective. Reporter with American Banker. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We might be on Cornelia Street right now, but Taylor Swift is definitely not heartbroken. From a $5 billion tour to a new movie on the big screen, Taylor Swift is all anyone can talk about. And her superstardom is expanding beyond the Billboard charts and having an unheard impact on the U.S. economy. From increasing viewership for the NFL to getting blamed for inflation, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style. And we have all the details for you right here on Yahoo Finance.
Live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City, top Russian and Saudi officials meeting in Moscow today to discuss the oil market amid escalating tensions in the Middle East. Our fears about demand destruction overdone. We want to bring in Yahoo Finances and Hes Frey. Very closely tracks the oil and energy market for us. Inez, what can you tell us? Yeah, Shauna. Uh, well, this comes at a, uh, on a day when Russia is holding its Russian Energy Week. That's today through Friday. And so officials are meeting and talking about what's been happening in the Middle East, <clears throat> excuse me, the oil markets. And also Vladimir Putin, President Putin, speaking at the forum, talking about <clears throat> the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict. And if that expands, he said that it will impact logistics, insurance, and freight costs. And he said that that's inevitable. He also spoke about the steps that Russia and Saudi Arabia have taken to uh, stabilize the oil markets. That means those supply restrictions. He said that the oil market is balanced thanks to open OPEC plus the production cuts that OPEC plus has taken this year. And he said that that more uh, may be needed. Further steps may be needed next year. He was asked if OPEC plus production cuts would be extended through 2024. Um, as far as the oil prices are concerned, look, you are looking at Brent crude that's down more than 2 percent right now. Remember that on Monday you saw Brent crude up more than 4 uh, percent and on WTI down 2.8 percent. So uh, Andy Lippo of Lippo Oil Associates has talked about this, that right now the fighting contained, uh, it shouldn't disrupt the oil markets. But the big question is, if somehow Iran were to be involved with this or targets in Iran were to be involved, then you would have a problem because Iran exports its oil to China and this is all part of the global oil market. So he is predicting that if there would be some involvement of Iran in the future, then if this were to expand, then you would see oil prices go higher. And the other big important factor is the Strait of Ormuz. And that is where much of oil goes through around in the Middle East. So if that were to close, you would see a big spike in oil because of that. And that's why Vladimir Putin also today at the Russian Energy Week spoke about that. If the fighting expands, you can expect to see prices go higher. All right. Yahoo Finance Zone, Inez Foray, tracking all of the movements, especially around that Energy Week International Forum there. Inez, appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Who wants to be a billionaire? The Powerball jackpot has now jumped to its second highest level in history, hitting $1.73 billion. I'll be right back. Got to go buy a ticket. <laughs> now, staying for a second. The lottery says the odds of winning this prize is one, and get this, 292.2 million there. So, yeah, give it a shot. Why not? But the odds are not in your favor in this case here. The odds are not in your favor. We know that there has been a quite some time since the last person won this Powerball. There's yep. always the big discussion about whether or not you take the lump sum, whether or not you take the payouts over time, what makes the most sense in terms of the tax advantage. So, of course, that discussion is back in play when we talk about something this size and how large this pot is. And when you take into account that it's $1.73 billion. There hasn't been a winner now for quite some time. It's the second largest in the game's history. And the next drawing's tonight, so we gotta go buy our tickets. They always say, though, you should not go in on these lottery tickets with your coworkers. They, yeah, well, look, if I, I did I see no downside, it, to be honest. I, I mean, 7.3 no, billion, right? there's plenty of money to go around. We'll find a way to divvy that yeah. up, even after taxes. Um, yeah, a few states not gonna be able to take advantage of this, though, ultimately. Alabama, sorry, Alaska, uh, Hawaii, Nevada, and Utah, Mississippi, they kind of have a new uh, lottery system, I think, as well here. But I was looking at the states that have the highest probability of winning, at least based on history here. The last top one, based on Jack Pocket, was one in California, but 45 Powerball states plus Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands here. Um, and the most has been in Indiana. Okay. Good for the Hoosiers. That's state. a little bit too far of a drive it for is. us, or a flight, yeah. at least at this point. But got to keep that in mind for next time. I was talking about the two different ways that you could go about this if you were to be the lucky winner. If there's just one winner in this, you have the choice of getting paid out over 30 years, or you can receive an estimated $756.6 million lump sum payment. Not bad. Either way. Lump sum. Hit me with the lump sum. Um, yeah. yeah. Over $700 million? Who's to say no to that? All right. Well, good luck to all of you out there if you decide to play the lottery ticket. All right. Well, if you play the lottery ticket, you get lots of money. You might be able to afford Disney because Ooh. Disney theme park prices, they're going up once again. The entertainment giant revealing more changes at Florida's Walt Disney World and also California's Disneyland theme parks. Now, annual passes for Walt Disney World will rise between $30 and $50 depending on the pass with the highest price settling at $1,449 $1, for its most expensive pass. That's a heck of a lot of money. Meanwhile, Disneyland is increasing almost all ticket options with single and multi-day ticket prices anywhere between $5 and $65. When we're talking about the uptick, the increase that we are seeing in the price of tickets for Disneyland, a couple of these numbers stuck out to me. On the most popular days, the prices is going to be up by more than 8% to $194 for one day. Five-day ticket at Disneyland, raising their prices by 16% to $480. That's a lot of money. And they're obviously doing this as they plan to spend even more into the parks business, and they're trying to offset yeah. the decline in the linear TV business and also all the spending that the company is doing in the streaming business, the DTC business. Yeah, I think from the analyst perspective, and what we've heard recently from some of the analysts that are looking across this parks business and looking across the acreage that Disney still has yet to build on top of, that's where some of the analyst uh, attention has gone here. And so if Disney is uh, eventually able to do that in Florida and then ultimately continue to take that experience Experience elsewhere uh, that is a positive especially given the international expansion that we've seen in that parks business but then you think about where this business is already running at a year-over-year -year clip it's already on a kind of nine-month scale 17 percent ahead of the earnings that they had seen in this segment last year and so all that considered it'll be interesting where the company places even more of an inclination in this part of the business and where consumers push back because I'll tell you what I'm, I'm staying down the street in celebration Florida <laughs> I'm not that I can't I'm not I sure I can afford Disney are, a lot of people cannot afford it at those prices especially <sighs> mid high inflation and sticky inflation the fact that people are spending more in almost every aspect of their life but Disney is doing this because of that investment that they are placing in their business they're planning to spend about 60 billion dollars in investments in parks and cruises division over the next 10 years, about double what they spent in the past 10 years. So we'll see what kind of improvements come from $60 billion. I don't know. I better be better getting be signatures yeah, from all the characters. Exactly. And private breakfast yes. for those prices, too. All right, guys, let's do a quick check of the markets before we let you go. Again, we're looking at gains across the board. The Dow up just above the flat line, up about two-tenths of a percent, as well as the S&P. You're looking at the NASDAQ up just about half of a percent. And Kiko Fujita has you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akika Fujita. Here's what I'm watching this hour. The inflation situation, wholesale prices coming in hotter than expected for September, hitting the highest annual rate in five months. We're going to discuss what this signals ahead for tomorrow's crucial CPI report. Pointing the finger, Sam Bankman-Fried's former girlfriend takes a stand for a second straight day to testify against the former FTX CEO, Caroline Ellison, saying, quote, he directed me to steal. We're going to bring you the latest from the trial. Plus, sliding into the public market, Birkenstock is making its debut on the New York Stock Exchange after raising nearly $1.5 billion in its IPO. How could the business fare in a challenging market? We'll discuss straight ahead. But first... Let's take a look at where markets are right now. The Dow uh, looking for another gain, fourth straight day, we should say, up 91 points right now. The S&P 500 up 12, and the NASDAQ up 90 points, uh, 90 minutes into the trading day. We did get a fresh print or a fresh snapshot of the inflation picture earlier today with economic data. Wholesale prices rising more than expected with the producer price index increasing 0.5%. For the month, uh, we have been watching moves on Treasury yields closely on the back of that, continuing to slide back here. Take a look at where the 10-year yield is right now uh, at 4.6%, uh, down about six basis points, the 30-year yield at 4.75. Well, as Fed speak has turned more dovish, investors are betting heavily in favor of a Fed pause in November. Markets now pricing in a 15.8% chance of a rate increase in November. That's down from a 23.1% uh, a week ago and 38.4% a month ago. Joining me with more on what could change the recent dovish outlook from the Fed is Josh Schaefer. And Josh, you know, a, a lot of these expectations getting pulled back because of what we just pointed to, those Treasury yields uh, doing much of the role for the Fed. Yeah, Akiko, yields sort of have been driving that for the Fed, right? I, I spoke to Gregory Daco yesterday, an economist over at EY, and he said a lot of what yields do is obviously that also relates to rates and the cost to borrow. So when you think about that cost to borrow as yields rise, the cost to borrow goes up and maybe economic activity slows down, which is, of course, what the Fed is looking for in order to keep inflation down. But there is one thing that could hurt what we're seeing as far as Fed bets go and as far as if the Fed were to hike in November. And that's this inflation port we're expecting tomorrow. So first, I want to go back a little bit and talk about Friday's jobs report. It was seen as an overall good report for the Fed, despite a high payroll number. So when you take a look at those payrolls, we saw that really hot print, right? You take a look at the September jobs report and what we saw for payrolls. It was considered a hot print because we had about 335,000 or 34,000 jobs added in the economy in September, that was a lot more than people had expected. But then when you fast forward to what we saw in wage growth, we saw the slowest wage growth since February, or sorry, since March of 2022. That is a big thing for the Fed. They want people to be making a little bit less money and more in line with what we're seeing in inflation so they don't have more money to spend. That would keep prices up. So we saw what we what we call a Goldilocks type scenario play out in that labor market. And now you fast forward to what we're going to see from inflation. This morning, we saw PPI come in hotter than expected. That moved up bets for a Fed rate hike just slightly. But then what does that CPI print do tomorrow? Economists think if it comes in hot, if it comes in higher than expected, you're looking at the headline number there that has ticked up over the last couple of months. If we were to see the headline number tick up again, even the headline number, not necessarily the core number, economists are worried that that could make the Fed want to hike in November. So we saw what we needed to see in terms of not getting a Fed rate hike from the labor report last Friday. But now, of course, the story is always inflation. And if inflation is coming down, can we have this relatively warm, we'll call it warm labor market, but still have inflation coming down? That's the Goldilocks scenario. We don't want that porridge to be too hot or too cold, Akiko. We need it just right. So we need inflation to be coming down tomorrow in that Thursday report. Yeah, we've been talking about Goldilocks so much, right? But it really <laughs> is where the Fed wants things to be. Uh, yeah. We started by talking about Treasury yields. And, you know, a few weeks ago, we could have argued that, look, with the yields doing the work for the Fed, that is even more reason to pause. But we have seen a pullback since, a bit of a risk-off scenario happening right now. What happens if we continue to see that pullback going into November? Yeah, Kiko, it's a great question. If we continue to see the pullback, then you wonder what the lagging effects will be, right? Because we talked a lot about the big spike in yields really through the month of September and in October doing some of that work for the Fed. But we still need 
people to be borrowing, right? We're talking about borrowing costs going up and that constraining the economy, but it's not necessarily the yield goes up one week and that strains the economy. You need it to sort of come through. So I think it's still lagging impacts that we're talking about there. And I think if yields were to continue to stay up where they are right now, that's still probably doing the work for the Fed because we're even the 10 year coming off the highest from 2007, it's still at 4.6%. And it's really important to note that is still high compared to what we saw pre pandemic and compared to what we've seen in recent years. So we're still talking about yes, yields off 16 year highs, but they're still high. And that can still constrain the economy a little bit and help the Fed out overall. Yeah, certainly complicating the picture for the Fed. Josh Schaefer is staying on top of that for us today. Thanks so much for that. Well, oil prices reached the highest level in over a year in September, pushing producer prices higher for the month. That PPI print coming in hotter than expected this morning, rising 0.5% for the month, that's compared to the 0.3% that was expected. Oil prices have pulled back recently, but the war between Israel and Hamas could keep costs elevated. Here now on what we can expect in terms of impact to markets. Let's bring in Sam Stovall, CFRA Research Chief investment strategist. Um, Sam, always good to talk to you. Looking at the PPI print this morning, um, I'm looking at where gasoline prices were. I mean, we jumped more than 5% when you look at that month alone. The Fed chair, though, has said, at least publicly, that you know really depends on how long these prices remain elevated. Given the impact we've seen so far, how do you view this? Well, good morning, Akiko. I view the uh, most recent PPI data as putting a little bit of pressure uh, on the CPI numbers for tomorrow, even though each of the components, meaning headline and core for both, um, uh, as well as the uh, those that are month to month, I think that uh, in general, because of how the market has responded today, uh, that uh, expectations are for inflation to continue to trend lower, as we saw with the most recent PCE report uh, that we saw earlier in the month. Uh, so my feeling is that uh, investors are looking upon next year as a year in which we're likely to see uh, inflation and earnings go in opposite directions, with inflation heading lower to about the 2.3% year-on-year level. Uh, by the end of the year, but with earnings up almost 12%. Core inflation, certainly uh, the metric that the Fed is looking at, although PPE uh, more than CPI, which comes out tomorrow. Um, what happens if that number comes in hotter than expected? Well, if it comes in hotter than expected, uh, I, I think the concern is that maybe we see a bit of uh, digestion of recent gains. But then obviously the, then the question will be, well, what happens to other economic data and the PCE numbers that will come out in the end of October? Uh, but I, I think in general, uh, the feeling is that inflation is headed lower. A lot of the more recent numbers were the result of uh, an inflated uh, energy price. And so they'll probably wait until next month to see how inflation has adjusted with energy prices coming down. Also, with the Fed likely to remain in a hawkish pause mode, we think that they're actually done raising rates for this tightening cycle and will actually start to lower rates in the third quarter of next year. Sam, Josh, earlier just talking about how the Treasury yields have, have done a lot of the work for the Fed since the previous meeting, but we have seen a pullback in those yields in recent sessions. What, what's the comfort level for the Fed? In other words, where do yields need to be in order for the Fed to say, look, we feel OK pausing come November? Well, I think the Fed realizes that it does not control long-term rates. It controls short-term rates and the effect on employment and on inflation. Uh, I think that by, by seeing this too, the trend in the 10-year note come down, uh, our expectation it'll average around 470 for the fourth quarter of this year, but then get down to about 445 next year. Uh, so our feeling is that uh, interest rates as well as inflation are in a downward trajectory and that will be just fine for the Fed. Does that mean from an investment standpoint for you, um, you're I increasing your exposure to Treasury? I mean, what does that portfolio mix look like for you right now? Well, our exposure is uh, fairly neutral at this point. Uh, we're looking at 60-40 uh, with 45% uh, of the equity portion in U.S. 
and 15% in international. Our belief is that we are going to be seeing interest rates come down. We are likely to see the, the value of the dollar uh, soften a bit too. Uh, we're looking specifically at mid and small cap stocks, which are trading at a more than 30% discount to the long-term average relative PE versus the S&P 500. Developed international is trading at a 20% discount to the long-term average, but also sporting higher dividend yields. Uh, so my belief is that we are headed higher for this quarter, and my year-end target remains at 45.75. Finally, Sam, uh, we're coming right up uh, to the start of that earnings season again with the big banks reporting later this week. What's the one number you're going to be looking for? Well, the one number, uh, I guess it would be more like uh, the thumb direction. And I think it'll be up for the diversified banks, but way down for the uh, regional banks. Regionals off 26%, whereas the diversified banks up 3%. Uh, but the real question will be about credit quality. And we think that management will say that quality remains firm, except for challenges in retail. I mean, in the uh, uh, real estate area. Sam Stovall, CFRA Research Chief Investment Strategist. Uh, good takes there. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Well, time now for a trending ticker. We are watching shares of Kava today after Morgan Stanley upgraded the stock from equal weight to overweight, getting a slight pop there. Uh, the couple, uh, Morgan Stanley urging investors to capitalize on the fast casual chain's growth potential. The analyst behind the call, Brian Harbour, cites favorable demographics for the brand amid economic uncertainty as one of the reasons behind his upgrade. Well, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance.
The former CEO of Alameda Research, Caroline Ellison, is back on the stand this morning in the ongoing trial against FTX founder Sam Bankman Free. The prosecution's star witness testified for roughly four hours Tuesday, blaming Bankman Free for crimes that led to the implosion of his crypto exchange. Ellison has already pled guilty to fraud and conspiracy. Let's bring in Brady Dale, Axios crypto reporter and author of the book. SBF, how the FTX bankruptcy unwound crypto's very bad good guy. Uh, Brady, good to talk to you today. Uh, so much intrigue, we should say, going into Caroline Ellison's testimony yesterday because of some of the backstory with her being his former girlfriend. How damning was the testimony on day one? I thought it was pretty damning. The thing that I've been most curious about, about the misuse of customer funds at FTX is like, when did it start? And at least if Caroline's telling the truth, it started from the very beginning of FTX. That was always the plan. You know, they might have used it in more innocuous ways early on, but Sam always had every intention for his traders at Alameda Research to dip into this line of credit that was based on the FTX customer's money. I mean, you know, a lot of this kind of goes into sort of the, the legal question about what the bar is to, to prove intent, but right. there's several reports coming out even ahead of her testimony about the fact that she has, in fact, um, told prosecutors that there was, in fact, this back door between FTX right. and Alameda. I mean, is that what it comes down to? Is that the smoking gun for the prosecution? I mean, I think so. You know, there's this whole question that sort of confuses me of like, you have to know you're committing fraud for it to be fraud. But, you know, FTX knows that it told customers uh, that it wasn't going to use their money outside of FTX. And Caroline was very clear on the stand. You know, she was a trader who was using lots of cryptocurrency exchanges. She wouldn't have been happy if any of them were doing what FTX was doing with their funds. So there doesn't seem to be any possible way that Sam couldn't have known that this wasn't right. And I guess the big point that Caroline wanted to make yesterday and the prosecution went to make is this was always at Sam's direction. This was always Sam's plan. Yes, she did it, but she did it because her boss told her to. Uh, certainly accusations even leading up to the trial of discrediting on the fa on the part of Sam Bankman Freed. Um, Caroline Ellison's testimony, there was that New York Times report that, that showed her mm -hmm. private writings that came out, um, which eventually led to him being jailed. But what is the defense? What does the defense hinge on at this point when you've got so many in his inner circle, already two that have testified, including Caroline Ellison, but many more? Well, I think Caroline and the prosecution did a great job of undercutting a key part of the defense's argument yesterday. So, you know, in the opening statement, the defense made a big deal out of Caroline's failure as a leader. They tried to present her as someone who made all these bad trades, that they were poorly hedged, and FTX and Alameda's collapse was really her fault just because she was bad at her job. Well, the the prosecution showed a copious documentation yesterday. We got we had extremely detailed look at these various spreadsheets that Caroline had made in 2021, where Sam had asked her to, you know, that he was making a decision, should I borrow another $3 billion from crypto lenders uh, backstopped by FTX customer funds? You know, should I or shouldn't I? And he asked Caroline to prepare these spreadsheets, like if various bad scenarios happened, could they still repay them? And Caroline basically came to the conclusion that like under certain conditions, conditions which actually did come to pass, you know, things like Bitcoin falling 50% or more, um, under certain conditions, she was like, there's there's a 100% chance that we will default on these loans if we take them out. And Sam, and so she was trying to caution, you know, let's let's maybe not do this. We don't need to do more venture investments. And Sam was like, no, I think it's really important. Let's take another $3 billion out. So to me, like that whole line of analysis sort of undercut this idea that Caroline is the one who refused to hedge. It really seemed, if, if she's telling the truth, that SBF was the one who was refusing to uh, to limit the risk. And Brady, I mean, this this is a subject you've obviously delved into. You've got a book, um, yeah. the book SBF, right? I mean, what yeah. surprised you so far in the trial? We're now on day four. What stood out to you in the testimony we've heard? Well, can I go into the weeds just a little bit? Because there was a big surprise yesterday that also goes into another book. Um, so to me, this was surprising. I could have it wrong. But um Yesterday, the prosecution on redirect with Gary Wong, another one of the co-founders, uh, was pointing out that one of the accounts that they that Alameda was using to show that they had plenty of money, uh, this Cottonwood Grove trading account, 
uh, he asked Gary Wong, like, what was in, you know, you, it shows $4.4 billion in there. What was that? And Gary Wong said, that's all, that was all FTT token. And the FTT token was the FTX exchange token that not many people wanted. If anyone had tried to sell $4 billion worth of it, the price would have tanked like instantly. Uh, so that was compelling in and of itself. Well, last night I finished Michael Lewis's book, uh, Going Infinite. And in that, he happens to mention that this Cottonwood Grove trading account was what FTX used to buy back FTT. And so what's curious about that is in the FTX white paper, when they said they would buy back this FTT, they were supposed to buy it back and burn it uh, using revenues from FTX. Because the idea was if you burnt the token, that meant the supply went down, which should mean the price goes up. That's the way that a lot of token issuers share revenues with their buyers. So it, it seems to me pretty clear from, from Wong's testimony yesterday that they were buying it, but they weren't burning it. And then they were using those assets to sort of make the argument that they had a net asset value that was positive, which is that to me was pretty crazy. The prosecution didn't break that out. Maybe it's too complicated, but uh, I thought it was a wild re revelation. I mean, what does that tell you about the plan that SPF had or the strategy overall? Well, I mean, to me, that's just another fraud, right? Like if you told people, like if you buy this FTT token, we'll use our revenues to buy it back and destroy it. So we'll share our revenues with you. And you don't do that. You just keep it and make another one of your assets. To me, that's just one more example of SBF's dishonesty. Okay, well, we'll be watching day two here of Carolyn Ellison's testimony. Uh, Brady Dale, good to talk to you today. Actios yeah, crypto thanks reporter for and the author of the book, SBF. Um, how the FTX bankruptcy unwound crypto's very bad good guy. Well, shares of Bitcoin falling for a fifth straight day today, hitting a one-month low. The crypto asset now down about 1.6% as investors turn risk off amid ongoing fighting in the Middle East and then uncertainty around Fed policy. That hasn't necessarily dampened enthusiasm for crypto ETFs with an increasing number of companies seeking regulatory approval. Let's bring in Hand ETF co-CEO, uh, owner and founder Hector McNeil to discuss risks and challenges of crypto ETFs. He's joining us as part of our ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Hector, it's good to talk to you today. Um, let's start first with the state of play, where things stand right now, because uh, certainly there has been a lot of anticipation for a spot Bitcoin ETF. How are you viewing this space right now? Yeah, so thanks for uh, having me today. Uh, yeah, it's re really interesting. Uh, everything's going on, the machinations in the uh, US ETF market. I mean, clearly, we've already got a, uh, a futures-backed uh, Bitcoin product. And uh, last week, we had a, a slew of uh, Ethereum products. Uh, but uh, there still seems to be a lot of... Uh, a lot of noise and uh, you know uh, confusion around uh, the spot products, and uh, nobody can quite understand why. Really, I mean, you know, we have them in Europe, uh, you know, which one of our products, BTCE, and uh, and also Canada as well. So, uh, so it seems very strange that the uh, SEC can't get its head around this. To be honest, uh, part of that is, uh, I'd imagine, some concerns about the risks associated with these ETFs. How do you break that down? Yeah, I, 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 that, that I think is a bit of a misnomer for me. I mean, I think the the horse has bolted uh, on uh, on the asset class. You know, I think that uh, cryptos have, have approved themselves in, uh, in 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 markets, particularly the uh, most liquid one, liquid ones being uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I, I've got to say that uh, it has to be. I mean, you, you've just talked about the FTX uh, scandal there. You know, and uh, having a, a, a regulated product traded on a regulated exchange. You know, only available through a regulated broker has to be a lot better than uh, the Wild West underlying crypto markets. You know, I mean, you see the uh, the spam emails that come through on get me quick schemes. Uh, you know, trading on some obscure Chinese or Turkish so-called exchange. You know, that surely has to be uh, a great way to gate the asset class, uh, putting it into the ETF wrapper. So I don't really buy that, and I think uh, it's nonsensical as well that you can give access to the asset class through a future, which is a derivative of the uh, the underlying without giving access to the underlying. And I think, uh, you know, GBTC in the US, and as I say, uh, products like BTC in Europe have proved that uh, you can do it with a spot as well. So, so I don't think there's much of an argument there really, to be honest. I mean, let's pick up on that point that you just made. Part of the challenge has been about regulating the domestic crypto exchanges, but also seeing the activity move offshore as a result of it. How how do you see that being resolved when you consider 
through sort of the broader context of you know crypto being traded right now? Yeah, well, the first thing I'd do is I'd uh, prevent crypto exchanges calling themselves exchanges. I think that's nonsensical and stupid, really, because I think there's a false equivalence. You know, the the, the average investor will see you know a crypto exchange in name and and, and conflate that with something like the uh, New York Stock Exchange or the uh, Nasdaq or the London Stock Exchange, and that seems to be absolutely crazy. At best, a crypto exchange is a uh, is a is a broker. You know, in the uh, in the securities world, you know, and uh, and such that should be labelled correctly. And I think if that was labelled correctly, I think people would see through the risks uh, a lot easier uh, with those sorts of uh, sorts of products. So, so I think that the uh, the, the the great thing about the ETF wrapper is it uh, really does give excellent price discovery. And you know, with all the market makers who are some of the most world class traders in the world, like the Susquehannas and flow traders of the world, uh, etc. You know. They're giving uh, you know institutional grade access to the asset class to all investors, retail, you know, through to uh, institutional. I always use my mother as an example. You know that uh, you know would I want my mum to go and trade on a on a Turkish uh, crypto exchange, or would I want her to trade an ETF? And I know my answer would be the uh, the latter. You know, one hundred and fifty percent of the time, no, no problem at all. Yeah, mom knows better than that, right? <laughs> Hector, um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about investment strategy here. I mean, given the ETFs that are already on the market, how do put, how do investors put their money to use? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of interest at the moment. We have we have a couple of really interesting ETFs. Uh, we do a we do a product with Sprott uh, uh, based on uranium miners, URNM, which is uh, eighty percent uh, uh, equities and twenty percent physical uranium, and uh, that's actually been the best performing thematic uh, globally this year. I think it's up about thirty percent. And I think it really just is responding to the, you know, the increased and uh, renaissance in nuclear power, you know, uh, with the squeeze on the uh, supply in uranium, which is obviously coming out of uh, coming out of Russia and getting away from, you know, taking that supply from Russia. And then the other area we're seeing a lot of demand in is we've got a future of defense ETF with a ticker NATO, believe it or not, that's, uh, you know, is a defense ETF that's aligned to NATO countries and affiliated countries. You know, and obviously with what's going on in Ukraine and obviously the, the devastating news over the weekend of what's going on in Israel, you know, those two those two themes have been incredibly interesting, you know, for investors. And we've seen a, a big slew of money going into both of those uh, strategies as, as, we look, as we look today. Some good takeaways there. Uh, Han ETF co-CEO, owner and founder, Hector McNeil. Good to talk to you today. Many thanks. Well, we've got more markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Well, reports suggesting Beijing plans to stimulate China's struggling economy, giving Chinese stocks a lift today. The world's second biggest economy, considering raising its budget deficit to spend more on infrastructure. We're on China's outlook. Bring in Yahoo Finance report Jared Blickery. Jared, we should say moves on the back of China's outlook. What are you seeing today? <laughs> Yes. Well, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? China has been under a lot of pressure this year in its markets, and it's been trying to stimulate these markets piecemeal. What you're looking at here is the NASDAQ uh, Golden Dragon Index uh, components, and you can see more green than red here on the back of the news of this stimulus. Basically, the, the federal government there is going to spend an extra trillion yuan, that's about $137 billion, in addition to what it was already going to spend. And this is significant significant because this is going to exceed its target of 3% of GDP. It doesn't want to have a budget deficit of greater than that. This is going to send it over the edge. And um, let's just focus on this heat map that I have working on the screen right now. You can see kind of a bifurcated market. This is a year to date. And um, if I put this on the last two months, you can really see the red kind of explode to the downside. This is where a lot of the losses have been taking place. And these are in some big names and some small names. You take a stock like Alibaba, which is down 8% year to date. Um, that's kind of uh, it looks like a lot of other stocks here. Nothing uh, extravagant to the upside or downside. Pinduoduo is one of the better behaving stocks. This only recently just broke out of its uh, trading range for the year. Uh, but overall, after the uh, initial expectations of that restart at the beginning of the year, beginning of the year after those faded, uh, the the federal government there and the PBOC have been trying to inject liquidity into the markets, but they do so at their own peril because once they ramp up their spending, that weakens the yuan, the currency. Now we're looking at here on the Wi-Fi Interactive, the US dollar <laughs> versus the yuan. You can see US dollar is sitting by the highs of the last year. In fact, it exceeded these highs from one year ago. And if I show you a max chart, you can see that there's not a lot of overhead resistance. We're basically at 2007 levels when the, the exchange rate was dropping, dropping, dropping into a new range. So not a lot of overhead resistance right there, which means that the Chinese government, if they issue too much currency, if they issue too much uh, debt or if they deflate their currency too much, well, they're going to have a problem on their hands because that encourages capital flight out of the country. And so that's kind of what they're battling there. It's a big move for China because it basically signals that the policy errors of the past are going to be corrected with more printing of money. And uh, that always means more devaluation of the currency. It's just a question of what, excuse me, at what rate and relative to the other currency of the world, currencies of the world, how does that play out? Yeah, it's starting to uh, sound like a very familiar plan that we have seen out of China. Uh, we'll continue to watch that story. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickbury. Well, staying on the China Bee, consumer spending pointing to further deceleration. The latest government data from Golden Week, that's an eight-day holiday pegged to China's National Day, points to spending increasing 9% from a year ago. It is a pickup in pace from August, but it indicates a less than 3% growth a year since the start of the pandemic. For more on China's economic picture, let's bring in Dennis Unkovic, partner at Meyer Unkovic and Scott. Uh, appreciate you joining us today. You know, let's start with what we have seen play out from Golden Week. You know, important to note for those who are not as familiar, this is one of the, the more lucrative holidays. The data points to people traveling and spending just not as much as the government had projected and certainly not a massive increase if you consider it to 2019 levels. You know, when you're looking at either 2019 or 2022, a 9% increase is really nothing. Um, uh, this is a, a period when the Chinese people love to get out, love to visit family. And I think that this is a, a disappointing at best statistic. What does that tell you about where consumer sentiment is right now? I think that the, the Chinese economy is in probably the worst position that I've seen it in in, in memory. A third of the Chinese economy, as you know, is based upon real estate. Their real estate uh, uh, is totally, uh, I don't even have a word for it, but it's so depressed that 
A third of the Chinese economy is now based upon real estate that's in free fall. I think there were some reports yesterday and today about Country Garden, which is one of the largest private real estate developers in China. Um, they owe about $187 billion, uh, and, and it's come out in the last several days they're not able to pay uh, people. What's really important, I think, is in the real estate market, if you want to buy a house, you order it ahead of time and you put money down. Sales have dropped for Country Garden 80% year on year to today. So the fact that they owe $187 billion or $200 billion, if they can't pay, I sort of see Country Garden uh, as like the, uh, I don't know what the expression is, a canary in the coal mine about what's happening in China. Because if a third of your economy is really depressed, and the Chinese people are not putting money in, into real estate, which they're not. Um, the fact that the Chinese government has said, we're going to spend another hundred and what $180 billion on uh, on uh, infrastructure yeah. projects, I think is, is really not going to have much of an impact. Uh, uh, Dennis, let's put that in context, though, because we have already seen Evergrande default on its debt. Sunak China, same thing. But Country Garden, in some ways, raising even more alarm bells, because this was supposed to be the good actor, right, in this space where we have seen so many companies taking on debt. The fact that Country Garden now missed one of its debt payments and is now saying they are in, in a serious condition here where they may not be able to repay, they may potentially default. What does that tell you about the severity of the real estate collapse that's playing out? What really worries me, great question, is that Country Garden was building uh, apartments, houses, everywhere in third and fourth tier cities in China. And that's how it got all of its money over the last couple of years. It was it was really the, the one everybody said, well, Country Garden showing what to do. When you look at China, when you see the problems with the economy, putting Shanghai and Beijing and Ningbo aside, those third and fourth tier cities are where a lot of these empty apartments are. And that's where Country Garden's been getting its money. So when you see their sales dropping 80% over a 12-month 12, 12 period, you know, year on year, that's really shocking. I don't think they will find enough money to, uh, to, to deal with the situation. And when you go to the equity markets, um, look, you mentioned Evergrande a minute ago. Evergrande uh, at its height owed about $300 billion, but that stock has plummeted 99%. Well, what do you think is going to happen with Country Garden when they – replace ever 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 grand as the canary in the coal mine how does the government uh, restore confidence in the space I mean, we have seen a number of measures whether that is cutting rates on existing mortgages uh, you know reducing the minimum down payment that's required uh, they're still not seeing investors coming back to the market so so what will it take to essentially prop up the market from where it is right now. So when I say the market, specifically the property market. Well, I think it's even worse than we've said. I'm sorry to be so negative. But um, uh, there was the three red line policy. The Chinese government, as far back as 2020, said, whoa, there's too much money going into these companies. Private uh, banks don't lend the money. So what happened then in China, they have what are called shadow banks. And the shadow banks will lend money uh, for example, if a bank would pay you one and a half percent on your savings, the shadow bank will say, look, I'll pay you six percent on your money. They then lend out money to people like Country Garden and Evergrande at 10 and 12 percent. Those shadow banks are now having problems because they're not getting paid back. And so the individual Chinese person who has put all or a significant part of their savings in what they're sometimes called trust banks, aren't getting repaid. Uh, one of them is an example of Zhang Rong is, is one of the bigger ones that's out there. So um, the Chinese government, I don't think, is able to solve this problem at this point, you know, lowering the interest rate. So maybe you'll buy a house because it's, you know, 25 basis points more. I don't think that's enough. And uh, you put your finger on what is, I think, the really key issue. Can the Chinese government solve this problem? If it bails out the country gardens and the Evergrands, it can, but that might cost a mm -hmm. trillion dollars. And the Chinese have just said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna increase infrastructure building. That does not address the basic problem of, will the average Chinese person put more money into real estate? And I think the answer is no. 
Well, that points to a further gloomy outlook for the world's second largest economy. We'll be watching closely. Dennis Unkovic, a partner at Meyer Unkovic and Scott, appreciate your insight today. Thank you. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance. We are waiting for Birkenstock shares to begin trading. Now expected to open between $42 to $44 a share. Let's go to Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma to learn more about the IPO. A lot of anticipation for this one, Brooke. A lot of anticip anticipation, Akiko, both on Main Street and Wall Street, as Birkenstocks have become a pair of sandals that consumers just have to buy four of them at a time. But now, as this company, this 250-year-old company, is set to make its public markets debut, the latest indication that we got is that it's set to open between $42 to $44. Now, that would actually be lower than what the company priced in at shares uh, last night on Tuesday evening. They priced in shares at $40. $46 a share. Now, if the company does go public at between 42 to 44, that would also be below the initial proposed range of 44 to 49 and or at the lower end of that. Now, despite that, there is lots of anticipation around this IPO as the IPO market continues to get buzzed. This is going to be the third largest U.S. IPO of the year, but we know that other IPOs in the game, whether Arm, Clavi, Kava, as well as Instacart, have received a choppy reaction on the street, but yet this 250-year-old company determined to push through that noise, determined to still make its debut today. And it's important to note that in fiscal year 2022, the company brought in 1.24 billion euros. It's growing at an annual rate of 20% from fiscal 2014 until last year. And it also sold 30 million units, 30 million, you know, uh, sand shoes, clogs, whatever it may be last year. And so lots of momentum building behind this IPO as we continue to see what exactly it debuts at. Yeah, it's incredible to think about the history of this company, right? We were just showing it since 1772, 250 years roughly. Why now? Why, why is, what is the company saying about why they decided to finally come to the public market? 
Right. Certainly the company has seen the test of time, has been through so much in this 250-year-old history. And as it makes its debut today, the CEO in a letter to proposed shareholders saying that this was the next logical step. He said, quote, we see ourselves as the oldest startup on earth, empowered by a youthful energy level with all the freshness and creative versatility of inspired Silicon Valley startup. And one can say that this really started or kicked off rather back. Back in 2013, when the now CEO came in to the company, then in 2021, the company, uh, the family side of the company, the two brothers decided to sell to El Caterin, the private equity firm. And now, uh, nearly uh, two years later, we're seeing the company decide to take this next step in the IPO debut, as they say the company now remains more relevant than ever. Of course, I, I can't help but continue to mention that buzz that came earlier this summer because of the Barbie movie around Birkenstock. And right now, Birkenstock really hoping to prove that they stand the test of time and they'll be a great investor for future shareholders. Full disclosure, Brooke, I am a huge fan. I think I counted like five <laughs> pairs. So I have one to keep going. I do stock. love them. <laughs> <laughs> They're comfy. They go with so many things. Uh, of course, we will be watching for that first trade. Brooke De Palma, thanks so much for that. Well, Sandal Brand Birkenstock set to make that debut on the New York Stock Exchange today. It's definitely in good company following a slew of other companies that have also debuted. That includes Arm, Instacart, and Clavio in a year that's seen an uptick in public listings that has some investors wondering about the strength in the IPO market. Our next guest says there may be a lot to like with Birkenstock, but there's also a number of questions and headwinds. Let's bring in our guest. Uh, we've got Rainmaker Securities Managing Director Greg Martin. Um, Greg, good to talk to you today. Let's start with Birkenstock. What do you like? What do you think is a concern? Well, thank you for having me, Akiko. Good to good to be on your program. You, you know, it's uh, as Brooke said. You know, it's a it's a great brand. It's grown. You know, on a very stable growth path since 2014. You know, over 20 percent every year. It's a very profitable business. Um, it's it's you know migrating more to direct to consumer model, which you know lowers its cost of acquisition. Um, you know, it's gone from 18%, you know, in 2018 to 38% of revenues now direct to consumer. So it's really more closely engaged with consumers versus just selling through retail. Um, it's 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 capitalizing on a trend of of going from more formal footwear to more casual footwear that was really accelerated, for, for, you know, in COVID. So there's a lot of good things here. Um, I think the challenge for them is that they've priced this IPO very high. Uh, from a valuation multiple perspective, it's about seven and a half times revenue, you know, 37 times forward earnings. It's it's a serious premium to where, you know, its comp set would trade. And I think, you know, when you price it to perfection, uh, you have to be perfect. You know, their, their next earnings report, they have to cons you know continue showing the kind of growth that they've been showing. And so I think the market is, it's going to be challenging for them to kind of live up to that valuation multiple. How do you think investors should should value this company? I mean, you mentioned it's a casual footwear company, and yet we have seen Birkenstock since it came under the LVMH umbrella um, increasingly go for sort of sort of the premium designs, right? They've got collaborations with the likes of Dior, up and coming designers too. How do you think investors think about the mix? Well, there's no doubt that LVMH is all over this brand. Um, you know, Bernard Arnault's uh, private equity firm, Al Catterton, is the majority owner. Uh, you know, his family office uh, made a significant investment in the company, He's putting his son on the board of the company. And so they are definitely trying to uh, be valued as a premium brand. Um, he's been very successful with other brands in his portfolio. I just think that at the end of the day, it is a footwear company. Um, you know, we are, it is a nice to have footwear versus, you know, maybe more must have products. And as we come into a potential declining, you know, consumer discretionary spend environment, um, they could be challenged to continue growing. But, um, you know, when they price their IPO at seven and a half times revenue, they are going for a premium branded multiple. And uh, they're going to have to continue to show great numbers to, to grow at the levels that they've been in the past. And I think the market's going to pay close attention to that. Having said all of that, it's a great company. People like it. It's as I said, there's there's a lot to like here, but I think the headwinds in the market are going to make it challenging for them to sustain this valuation.
this is just the latest in a slew of IPOs that we have seen over the last month. We talked about ARM, Instacart, Clavio. Now this, obviously each with their own individual stories, but what does the performance of these other names that have preceded Birkenstock tell you about what the appetite is in the market right now? Is it about profitability? Is it about growth prospects? What are investors hot on? Yeah, I, I think I think it's about there. You have to show growth, uh, you know, for sure. But I think you need to show profitable growth. I think people. I think this is going to look more like ARM um, than it is, you know, like Instacart. I mean, I think there's a there's a long term, you know, growth story here that people can get behind. People like the fact that it's profitable, um, and, and so so I just don't. I, I think that these companies um, have actually outperformed the market in general, even though the. The you know the IPO performance has been relatively tepid relative to what we might have been used to back in the you know heyday of 2021. These companies have actually performed pretty well, but I, but I do think the bar for going public is very high. Uh, Birkenstock is a company that should be public uh, for all of the reasons we stated, and and I and I think it will it will take more companies that are having showing stable profitable growth to to enter the public markets, and I and I expect that the next slew of companies will look more like more like Birkenstock than like some of the fast growing, but very unprofitable businesses that we saw going public in the past. Uh, Greg, you mentioned ARM, but you could argue even that name, you know, there's initial enthusiasm about the potential for growth, you know, beyond sort of their core business into AI. But since then, we've seen the street turn a little more skeptical about their prospects beyond what they have already proven. I mean, what does that tell you about how discriminatory investors are likely to be in any IPO that comes to market in this environment. Yeah, I mean, we look at ARM, they really weren't growing when they went public. Um, in fact, they had sl slightly down growth. And, and so there was a, bit, a little bit of a bet on uh, the growth of AI. You know, they, they're closely tied with NVIDIA, which has been one of the hottest growth stories of the year. But I think the market is taking a, a show me, uh, you know, perspective on, on ARM. It's they need to actually show that the, their chips are going to be embedded in the next generation of AI. And until those results come out, I think the market is sort of in a wait and see approach with ARM. And, and despite that, they, they, their, their uh, stock has traded up a little bit. Um, so it hasn't been terrible, but I think there's a wait and see approach happening for ARM. And, and listen, I, I think these companies are going to come out, have to come out and come into this headwind economy that we have and show that they can, they can actually prove a growth story. And I think there's a big wait and see perspective being taken by investors at this point. Okay. Rainmaker Securities Managing Director Greg Martin, uh, good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, time now to talk about EVs and the road ahead. For those in the market for a new car, how many are on the market for an electric vehicle? Yahoo Finance's Pras Subramanian hopefully has the answer for us with the results of our new poll U.S. market. How much more can it expand given the current firms? Well, according to our new poll done with Yahoo Finance and Ipsos, I don't know how much more it can go beyond that, as of, at least as of right now. Uh, we polled over 1,000 people here uh, from at the, at the end of September and beginning of October, and it found that 57% of respondents said they were not likely to purchase an EV, whether it was a new EV or, or new to them. Only 31% said they were likely to purchase an EV. Uh, now, EV is defined as a plug-in electric or a fully electric car. Um, you know, I've been tracking these polls for some time now, and usually it's around 50%. So... Um, to see that slight downtick to 57% or, or more leg negativity sort of new here, you know, drilling down deeper, we're seeing some of the same concerns that we've heard about before. 70% are worried about overall cost. 73% are concerned about driving range. And 77% noted a lack of charging stations or perceived lack of charging stations. So, you know, Americans, and also I want to mention, Americans aren't happy about, about mandates to sort of kill gas-powered cars. 61% of people oppose those restrictions. So, but it, there is a silver lining though for, for, for governments and, and, and people that want to sort of see the EV uh, expansion here in the, in, the, in the country continue. Uh, basically only 20% are aware of recent price cuts of EVs, like for instance, Ford cars and, and Tesla EVs. And only in the same amount, 20% are aware of charging deal expansions, right? So Tesla's expansion of its supercharger network to other automakers, they're not aware of that, but that's happening. So education is sort of key here. If the country's going to see, you know, the Biden administration's 50% mandate of EVs by 2030. Yeah, and especially if the concern is cost, you know, educating consumers on the fact that there's a generous $7,500 incentive there, at least for new EVs. What did you find in terms of 
brands that prospective buyers are looking right at right now? You know, Tesla has been leading the way. What are some others that have gained? So yeah, we asked about what brand people would consider if they were to buy an electric vehicle in the future and uh, as their next car. And I was surprised to see that Toyota tops the list at 30%. That's a big number here. And if you think about it, Toyota only really has the the BZ4X, which just came out. It's in limited limited capacity there. But they do have the Prius, so that's sort of what maybe why, why they're top of mind amongst consumers. Tesla was next at 23%, so they're a little bit, a little bit behind Toyota. And you know, Tesla's the biggest player in the market right now. Honda at 20%, they don't even have any EVs out yet, right? So uh, GM at 15%, that's going to be ramping up second half of the year. And Ford, of course, uh, has had EVs on the market for a couple of years now. So Ford, they're rounding out the top five of the uh, marks that we've seen. Also want to quickly note that Mercedes and BMW in the luxury premium segment, they sort of popped up in our, uh, our, our survey too, but we didn't actually pose a question as to what premium or luxury EV makers you would actually consider purchasing for your next EV. Yeah, I mean, that seems to point to that education part being key, you know, given the top names. I'm surprised Toyota and Honda are on there given how much they've lagged the market. Prasi Romanian with the latest poll on EVs. Thanks so much for that. Thanks. That does it for me in this hour. Uh, we'll be right back here again tomorrow. See you then.